Hello, Orville Nation and Nerd TV. How is everybody doing? Hello, Dean Myers. Hello, Dean. Hello, Corrine. Hello, Berta Frey. Berta Frey's on the panel. Um, who else is in here? Lord Thoth. Good to see you, Lord Thoth. Welcome, everyone. Everyone who's in here. And George Peter Jatsis is also on the panel. Um, we have a very exciting guest for you guys tonight. Um, it's a treat, and we're going to introduce him very shortly. He is uh, he is joining us from down under. Uh, so let me um, let me just bring in our panel, and I want to introduce, of course, uh, you all know um, the great George Peter Gatsis. Hello, George. It's good to see you. It's been a while, my friend. How are you? Greetings. Um, uh, it's, yes, it has been a while. And I'm doing fine. Uh, I hope all is well with you. And greetings, chat. Greetings, D uh, DJ, uh, Myers, uh, Lord Thaw. And I'm um, very excited to be here. I'm very excited with our guest. Yeah, we have an amazing guest tonight. Um, he is uh, he has done iconic work in the industry. Um, he's a very humble and kind gentleman. Uh, he's a gentleman. He's quite a gentleman. And um, I had the privilege of meeting Wayne uh, through Doomcock, uh, through Overlord DVD. And um, and uh, I've been wanting to to be able to connect with him more. And it's uh, it's, you know, the fact that he's taken time to to uh, to be with our humble channel uh, tonight is uh, is such an honor. Let me bring in the rest of the panel. Um, I want you guys all uh, what well, you guys all know. Uh, the one and only Bird of Prey 5. Hello, Bird. How are you, my friend? Hello, world. It's Bird of Prey 5. Kapla. Kapla. Doing good, DJ. Thank you for asking me here. Thanks for Pleasure. joining us. Yeah. Um, and welcome, very George. Excited. Apologies greetings. again. No, no. Greetings, Bird of Prey. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, Bird, do you want to tell us what's going on on, uh, on the Bird of Prey channel? The Any Bird of Prey 5 channel. Uh, we uh, just put up our usual weekly Star Trek Discovery review. Tomorrow we do our usual bed live stream in the evening. Uh, Saturday we have our Cinema Saturday. We'll be doing Die Hard because it's Christmas time. Uh, and then Sunday we have a usual Futurama Sunday afternoon stream. We watch episodes of Futurama. And uh, that's it. Then Monday the week starts over again. Oh, I, I got to I got to intrude here. Bird of Prey Five. Everybody has an incredible uh, music uh, that he and uh, Andy <laughs> Trekker have done. I think everybody should listen to it. it um, that's all I'm going to say because I was able to hear it for, uh, for the first time. Uh, was it a week ago or, or a couple of weeks ago? Um, dude, that was awesome. Which music? Yeah, the the one with. Um, uh, you and the anti trekker. Uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. I gotta look it up. Quite a few of the music uh, from my channel, Anti Trekker's channel, comes from Piano Dean. Yes, that's him. Okay. Piano Dean. Yes, Piano uh, Dean, a very out. talented person in our community. Uh, oh, okay. puts out great, great songs. What a talent! What a talent! And uh, it, it's it's a beautiful song. It's it really, really catchy. Let me introduce, um, and we'll have to check that out. Let me introduce uh, somebody you also know. Um, he is a, a friend of the channel. He is a um, he's a starting filmmaker. His name is Jack Beers. Hello, Jack. Jack just joined us. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you, my friend. Yes, glad to be here. Kapla, Jack. Uh, Kapla. Green Jack. Green Jack. <laughs> And Jack was responsible for that uh, for that little um, uh, short film that he put together with using cameos. Uh, he did yes. a cameo challenge of a film, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that too. Uh, that was fun. Gotta and do what, that again. What's new for you, Jack, this week? Um, well, I, I watched uh, I watched the new episode of Discovery, and uh, and well, 
yeah, it was exactly what I expected. Uh, <laughs> I expect, you know, be, uh, you know, with the with the Discovery Mirror World, I expected everyone to die. <laughs> I expected, I expected the uh, the the uh, uh, Guardian thing, uh, stuff like that. Um, otherwise, I'm 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 here enjoying uh enjoying my time off with you guys. <laughs> oh, come on, you gotta admit, the, the moment uh, you heard him say, "I am," a, you just freaked out. I freaked out. I, I don't know if I freaked out. I was expecting it. Um, I was actually expecting him to literally do that, to say, I am the guardian of forever. Um, because the episode before, if you paid attention to the newspaper, I think it was called the Star Dispatch. That was the same name of the paper that was used in um, the Guardian of Forever episode. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I was, I was expecting it um, once I saw that. Let me ask George real quick uh, before before we introduce um, Wayne. Let me ask George real quick. George, is there anything new for uh, for George Peter Gasset this week for your channel? Uh, it, uh, all I'm doing is uh, I'm creating props that are going to be appearing in my comic book, and I'm making actual physical 3D prints of them. And so, when are you when are you like when are you launching your uh, campaign for uh, for Joe King too? I think it's going to be in January because um, I, I've been delayed with uh, actually doing uh, corporate work. And uh, helping other uh, uh, comic book pr productions uh, get their stuff polished and whatnot, so it, it just took away too much time for me. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm not going to rush it, uh, but I am going to show off uh, the spaceship, the DeLorean, or my version of the DeLorean, and uh, a, a few other props before I actually launch. So that way, people say, oh, I want the spaceship. Oh, yes. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, well, oh, Bird, Bird of Prey Five. I, I I showed it off on uh, uh, on one of the streams that he was on. Yes, it was beautiful. Uh, a tremendous spaceship. Incredible detail. Jealous. Oh well, well, what you're gonna have to before we end the stream, George. Uh, we're gonna. No, you're no, gonna... no, 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 no. We're we're here for our wonderful guest. Yeah, that will be for another time. I, okay. I, I, I think I think I'm just going to shut up and wait for to talk to our guest now. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to introduce um, Wayne Hogg. He is uh, he is from Australia. He's uh, he's joining us from Sydney right now. Uh, Wayne has been um, uh, in in so many works that you and 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 all of us have, have are familiar with. Everything from um, the Maze Runner series, uh, Lord of the Rings, Fifth Element. Um, we know that he's working on Ghostbusters Afterlife, but he can't say anything. So uh, um, we just know he's working on it. And um, and um, I'm looking at his IMDb right now. Um, Superman Returns. I like Superman Returns, by the way. Although some people don't like it. But uh, Farscape. Um, uh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. I want everybody to give a nice, warm welcome uh, to Wayne. And Wayne, it's such an honor to have you. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thanks, PJ. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Um, and I, I have an icebreaker question that just, I was going to ask you a different question, but um, after what uh, Bird, Bird of Prey said, um, I figured I would ask you this. Um, is Die Hard a Christmas movie, Wayne? What do you think? Absol absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so Good Bird night. is going to be showing that on his next stream. <laughs> um, cool. Now, uh, Wayne, um, I, I know, like we had a little pre-conversation um, backstage. Um, wh what what got you into the field that that you're in? Star Wars. Simple Heck as that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, actually, nice. Star Wars. <clears throat> Star Wars and. Well, around the same time, um, in my li school library, there was a lot of science. There were some science fiction books put out, mostly uh, like the um, English science fiction. It's what I call the golden age of science fiction illustration. A lot of English guys, Jim Burns, Tim White, some of these dudes were doing a lot of covers. Chris Foss, of course. And I was seeing all these, you know, like the E. Doc Smith um, novels and so on, and just science fiction images and then you know star wars around the same time so both of those things kind of really hooked me in but star wars was like sealed the deal 
And I was like, seeing those worlds, just those vistas, which I then learned were map paintings. And I was like, I've, I've got to do that. I, wow. that's, that's what I want to do. And then I spent a lot of time just working out, what's a map painting? What does that mean? How does that work? And uh, then just being a fan of, <coughs> excuse me, being a fan of how they made this stuff, you know, and finding out who Ralph Macquarie was and, um, you know, um, Harrison Allenshaw and, and then his father, who was, you know, Peter Allenshaw and um, Sid Dutton and all these other guys and L. Whitlock, who was, you know, one of the master uh, map painters on um, a lot of the Hitchcock films and so on. So just learning about all that, becoming a fan of, how they made these movies it was um, howdy. And how big were the how big were the mats that they were the matte paintings that they were using? Well, they varied. Um, <clears throat> excuse me again. I should warn you, uh, PJ, just before you go any further. I'm expecting a delivery, so oh. if you hear the buzzer go off, I'm going to ignore it, but because I don't want to. No, uh, no, no, no. Upset, if upset you, the you stream. Know, so if just the, when if, you hear it, I'll just ignore it, or I'll mute it if I can. But. And we'll just but let it go. Please go do what you got to do. We're, we're, we're no, 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 it's cool. Yourself. It's cool. I can go to the post office later, but I just forgot that it, it's likely to buzz. So if you hear a buzz, it's, it's my, uh, it's well, the mailman. I, I don't, we don't want you to have to go to the post office later. Just get up and do it. Oh, no, 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 that's cool. Do. No, 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 it's fine. They just 10 minutes <laughs> okay. down the road. No big deal. That's fine. Um, um, so what was the, qu what was the question? Uh, oh, map, uh, how big was the map the, paintings? The mats? Yeah. Well, a lot of these stuff for Star Wars were, I think somewhere around about like anywhere from six to eight feet. Which are, you know, nice, decent size. Um, I've since learnt that some of the older uh, map paintings of, you know, f films in the 30s, 40s, 50s and so on were actually quite small. It d would depend on what they needed. But the Star Wars ones were, were nice and big. <clears throat> I remember seeing one. I went to ILM. This is fast forwarding my kind of story of how I got into the industry. But I went to ILM um, in 95 uh, as a guest of one of the, an Australian woman who worked at ILM. And I went in to see... That this was before they um, they were in um, Marin, is it Marin County, and it was called Kerner Optical Research. If you ever went, it's, it's like an industrial estate. It's a no, nondescript industrial estate, and it was a, just a plain door Kerner Optical Research, which I knew was ILM. And knock on a door, and you know, went in there, and you wouldn't know. I swear to God, you'd walk past it and think they were just selling, you know, making, you know, bottle cop. Uh, caps or something like that. What year was this, Wayne? This was 95. Okay. Yeah, it was about July 95. And then, um, so I walk in there and in the reception waiting for uh, this woman, Karen, to come out. And there's a Return of the Jedi map painting up on the wall. I think it was the, from memory, it was, um, it was the landing platform with the, the shuttle lands, with Vader's shuttle lands. I think it was that one. Uh, the, the Endor, the Endor scene. Yeah, yeah, on Endor. Oh, um, nice. They, yeah, I mean, the, the the amazing thing for me to look at that was that the painting was so rough and loose. It was just, it's like a dog's breakfast. I was like, oh my god. But when you film that from a certain distance with a camera and its projection on a screen, it it actually looks like it's much further away, and so all those you know that mushiness tends to resolve itself into this nice image and it looks believable and i was like holy shit that's amazing so that was pretty cool just to see one up uh particularly you know something from now <clears throat> the trilogy we all love now for example the 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 i saw some on your website we'll, we'll show it a little bit later um some of the um the large paintings that you have on on your website how large how large do you sell them the biggest one I've done is 66 inches. I'll use the American terms because a lot of people will get that. So it's about a meet, just over a meter and a half. Because I never got to, when I started working on the fifth element as a matte painter, I came in at the very tail end of traditional painting and the very beginning of digital painting. So I never got to experience that profession as a traditional matte painter, unfortunately. So me oil painting, like this, Thing back here is is the real oil painting i notice you've had it on the on your uh, icon for the for the show mm -hmm. but um so this is about a meter long so it's about 40 odd inches but that's just me you know having fun i want to see if i can maybe 
Alright, see. Yeah, wow. This is beautiful. Oh, wow, look at that. I can't uh, actually see what, that's great. What, what I'm looking at here or what you guys are seeing, but anyway. <laughs> that's a nice. Yeah. And seeing, and seeing that in, 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 in scale to you compared to what I see on the website, wow. Yeah. Well, that's only a sort of a medium sized one. So you think of one another, you know, half that again or, or nearly double that. So that's just me, you know, playing kind of traditional map painter because I never got to do that when I was um, starting out. And obviously from Fifth Element, which was 96, 97, that was, I think that was pretty much it. There might've been one or two uh, traditional map paintings done for other projects. I think there was one, the last traditional map painting I, I believe was one of the last shots in Titanic of the, there was a ship on the distance on the, on the ocean. And that was oh, a traditional wow. one. I think, huh. I think that might be the last traditional map painting ever done. Everything after wow. that was digital. With paint, huh? Okay. And they paint on masonite or they paint on glass, you know, reprojection and all that kind of stuff. So I missed out on that. Wow. Um, now, um, so would you, was Fifth Element like really what, uh, what got you going? I, I, um, my history is I, w I was an electronic technician for the Department of Defense for about six and a half years. I did an apprenticeship and then worked as a, as a technician for a little bit. And then I got really? retrenched from that position. I always wanted to be a, um, a photographer, an artist and map painter. And so I went to study photography and I got my photography degree after that job. And then at the end of my degree, this is what I started to combine Photoshop to where I discovered Photoshop. Um, I was um, building miniatures as well and photographing miniatures and compositing them uh, in Photoshop and photographing people and so on. <clears throat> and I created a portfolio that I took to uh, the SIGGRAPH conference in Los Angeles in 95. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and all the visual effects companies were set up there. SIGGRAPH is um, a conference for everything from scientific visualization all the way through to fine art. And um, so I took my portfolio, uh, it's 35 mil slides, and I was lucky enough to get a job with Digital Domain, who had just done Interview with a Vampire, Apollo 13, you know, um, True Lies, all these really, you know, cool projects. And it was nine, took about nine and a half months for the um, immigration process to go through before I could get, I had to leave the US, I was just there for the conference, I had to leave the US, nine and a half months later, I come back and start working. Now they hired me within their new games division. So they were gonna make some big science fiction game. And that turned out to be completely bogus. They had some other games going, but they just needed people that just could use Photoshop and just work on these other games. And I was bitterly disappointed because I sold everything I owned to get there to work in, you know, a science fiction game, which I thought, well, it's a start. My foot's in the door, but that didn't exist. I was Monday, Monday morning, some guy says, hey, you're the new guy, come over here. I wanna tell you something. You just wasted your time. <laughs> the game doesn't exist. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Anyway, so by Tuesday, I'm walking past the, the um, cubicle of an art director on Tuesday, and he's reading Mobius, the Inkel. And I'm like, hey, man, I love that comic. I love that graphic novel. So we start chatting, and he says, oh, we're making this movie based on Mobius's work. I'm like, oh, you're kidding me. He says, yeah. He said, what, what are you doing here? I said, well, I wanted to be a matte painter and so on, so on, blah, blah, blah. And he says, oh, we need matte painters. I'm like, Oh, you know, it's like the heavens open up, the beam of light came down. I was like, this is it, this is the moment. So I said, man, I've got, I've got to show you my portfolio. And so by Thursday, I was transferred out of the games department into the film department and I was working on the fifth element. Wow. That was it, that's where I started. That's, that's one of my uh, favorite movies, Fifth Element. And <coughs> ironically, yeah. I just recently watched it last week and I was appreciating, you know, when I went on your website and I was appreciating uh, your your art uh, that was that you contributed to that movie. Uh, it's very impressive. You did the departing station in New York, it looks like. Yeah, those two big, there's the, um, what we call the Floston shuttle shot where the shuttle comes out of the spaceport. And the, um, the Thai restaurant shot in New York. I did those pretty much because I was a beginning, I was a young artist then. So I did those under the direction of a guy named Kevin Mack. And he pretty much kind of at, at a certain point, he just said, okay, it's all yours. Just keep going, finish them off. 
but I did those under I harassed the <laughs> I harassed the VFX supervisor for weeks just to get I, was, I said, look, man, I'm, I didn't come all this way just to work on some crappy little thing, which is pretty, you know, obnoxious <laughs> of me to say at the time. And I had, seriously, I had no place to ask for that and to request those shots. I really didn't. And I really didn't have the skill either to pull them off. But they must have seen enough. And maybe it was my constant harassment. They said, oh, God, shut this guy up and give him the damn shots. But only under Kevin's supervision, thankfully. Otherwise, very <laughs> they would have been royally screwed up, those shots, I could tell you. Yeah. What, what kind of, what kind of brief, uh, briefings do you get to, to uh, produce these paintings? Well, for those particular shots, um, certainly the Floston shuttle shot with that dome spaceport, there was a sketch by Jean-Claude Mezier that when I look back on that sketch is actually more accurate and more correct than what we did as the map painting. I suppose the map painting has a certain look and the film has a certain look and it's got a bit of a graphic novel feel to it. But the Jean-Claude Mezier sketch was was nailed, and I don't think we I don't think we hit a target necessarily. If you look at the two together, you say, "All oh, right, I get it," but I think he got the scale correct, and I didn't. So that was pretty. That one was pretty straightforward. Um, but as a matte painter, you've got live action or some portion of live action with a green screen or a blue screen, so you don't have to really think too much about what you have to do. It's just what would be there. What what blanks are we filling in? Um, with those shots, particularly that one, the Floston shot, that was the entire screen. And as I said, Kevin was the uh, main guy and he pretty much blocked it in for me while I was building the spaceport in 3D. And once you get a certain hook into a project or a brief, yeah, the rest is pretty much um, common sense. You know, you just think about what would be there, what time of day, what's the weather, what's the lighting and so on, and then you just take it from there. I know that sounds simplistic, but it's kind of is. The hardest thing for me is when someone says, oh, here's a really loose brief. We want sort of like this, and I go, oh my God, now what do I do? I like a, I like a tight brief. It's very helpful. Uh, now, um, within, within just a couple of years, you, it looks like you get, take it, like, do you, um, do you do you go back to um, do you go back to Australia to do Farscape or do you work yeah. from California? No, I was in I was in LA for a year, almost exactly a year. Um, my grandmother was dying of cancer, so I, I went back to Australia, and I worked in a small post production company for a year, exactly a year. Uh, we did TV commercials. <laughs> I've come from Fifth Element, like this is my first film job. I hit the top straight away. My first job in this small company was a dog food commercial. <laughs> It was like, all right, so this is this is the reality. This is 90% of people in the film industry are doing this sort of stuff, you know. And I wrote, I had to paint the word tangy. Someone opens a jar of mayonnaise and the word tangy appears and then it fades away. I had to paint that, the word, you know, it's just stuff like that. So that was um, that was a bit of a, a, an eye-opener of the, the reality of the industry. And so exactly a year there, and then I moved up to Sydney and we worked on uh, the very first season of Farscape. And I was one of two map painters. The other map painter was the VFX supervisor, but I was sort of my job was just map painting. So we kind of wow. interleaved the uh, the episode. Did the fact that you came from uh, a sci-fi uh, project help to get the? Discord? I think so. I was apart from this other guy um, who was an Englishman. I think I was probably one of the only, if not the only, or the first digital map painter in Australia. And if, so when if, I came back, that was, I think, a bit of a no-brainer when they found out that I was back in Australia and they were doing Farscape and they were looking around for people to do that sort of work. So it was easy enough to drive up and live in Sydney. If I could ask on like something like Farscape, how many like matte paintings would there be per episode or per season? Well, I only worked on the first season. Um, it would vary on the, on the episode. Some I might have just... Dargo's ship, I think, I put in the background into a bush scene at some point. Uh, there might have been, like, say, two small map paintings, and then on others there was a lot. Um, what I tried to do and wanted to do... I didn't want to do the... 
thank God not strike me down for saying this, but I didn't want to do the Star Trek thing where they re reused the same map paintings over and over again, or they just graded a daytime map painting for nighttime. Now I understand why they did that because they were mostly traditional back then. And so they couldn't exactly just go ahead and repaint another, you know, map painting of say the Klingon homeworld from 10 different positions in different points of view. As much as we'd love to have seen that, you, they couldn't do that. But that's what I wanted to at least attempt and try not to repeat the same map painting over and over again. And the supervisor agreed. So we, we did our best to, you know, not have to do that. So there's like planet scenes to say a ship approaching a planet. We just vary those as much as we could. So there might've been anywhere up to maybe say 15 map paintings in some episodes wow. would be the max. But that'd be a lot of planets, you know, and so on of ships flying over planets and whatnot. You see the arc of the planet. <clears throat> um, but in terms of like full on map paintings, I maybe five or six, four, it depend. But, but they were fun. Very wow. cool. Um, now, uh, what is what is the hardest thing that you the hardest project that you've ever worked on, or what's the hardest mission uh, objective you've ever been given? In a it's usually profession? the next project because I always freak out about am I good enough? Do I remember how to do this? You know, but particularly working with a new uh, client or a new production designer or something because I don't do map paintings anymore. I'm now concept concept artist, so I've gone from post production to pre production. So inventing this stuff is a lot harder. I find it as a map painter, it's pretty easy. Like I said, you've got live action, you've got all these things that are established. You know what's there. There's a script. Everything's done. There's dialogue. It's all established. An art director has pretty much established what a lot of this stuff is going to look like. But as a concept artist, you have to invent this stuff, and that's it's a bit more of a challenge. So. Um, anything to do with inventing architecture or designing architecture, I just start to get a, you know, a bit of a sweat going. <laughs> I like landscape, you know, any skies, landscape, mountains, is, it's okay, but architecture, architecture is a bit of a, bit of a worry for me. Because I'm not really an architect, I'm mean, a photographer, that's, my back, that's where I started really. So the photographic aspect I love, but the, the designing of stuff, I, that's a bit of a, bit of a challenge. Where do you where do you um, go for inspiration when you when you have to oh, make this stuff up? Ralph McQuarrie, Sid Mead, Mobius, the those main giants. There's always something you can always figure out or get get some point of you know idea for some job. But usually, as a concept artist. The inspiration has to come from that script and that brief that you've been given because that's you're trying to design something for that show and that scene or that that location or that set and so for me one of the, I'm a, i also teach color and light at a small school here in sydney and one of the things i tell my students is that you need to fall in love with the subject matter even if you're not into the subject matter or you don't know anything about it you need to find a way to fall in love with that shot and so for me, it's, it's lighting, it's color and light and mood. So it doesn't matter what era, it could be historical, it could be science fiction, it could be modern, it doesn't matter. I, I can find a way to fall in love with those shots and get into it because, and composition of the frame, what's in the composition, where's the camera, that I can, that's my hook in, that's my, you know, I can love that for that, those aspects and not really have to know much about the content. Although I try to educate myself into the content, but. By the way, when you, you said something really interesting that, that I think really, I, I didn't, you didn't mean to do it, but uh, it really touches a nerve with our greater fan community and the fact that um, there's a lot of, we like a lot of us feel that there are a lot of people working on, on sci-fi projects that haven't fallen in love with what they're working on. And, it, and it, as a creator, it, it means a lot to the fans. Like you just said, like, yeah, you, you really want to, you know, put your heart into it. If you're a professional artist, you put your heart into it no matter what. You should be anyway. And if you're not, eh, maybe you should be doing something else. Um, I'm trying to think of... Oh, okay, so Wolverine. I worked on the Wolverine and a lot of the scenes I had to do were, I suppose, modern day, even though it's somewhat a science fiction story, but it's mostly modern day Japan. Hmm. That's not something I necessarily go out and paint myself. But so I want to, you know, 
again, find a way to fall in love with the shot I have to create, whatever that might be, an interior, exterior, daytime, nighttime, who knows, whatever's going on, a train station. There's ways to make it, for me, really interesting that I can get my teeth into. And it could just be subtle things of artificial lights and how they reflect on some things and how it reflects on wet stone. And I can get right into that technicality of the painting side of things without really, with the subject not being my main interest, you know, per se. So uh, the, the image you've got on up at the moment, that's one of the things I was thinking of doing at one point was giving away when I sort of transitioned out of visual effects and into uh, concept before I became a concept artist, I was wanting to maybe go and become a photojournalist. Hmm. Because uh, again, photography is that other side of my, you know, creative uh, interest. And one of the things I wanted to do was go and sh uh, shoot all those, um, all that ship breaking around India and Pakistan and all that kind of stuff. And that's what that is. Oh, wow. That's that ship breaking taken to the you know nth degree of these big behemoth ships that have just been dumped on a planet and and broken down are your are your paintings um the first time uh, a, uh the producer the art director uh, and and the art departments everybody uh, is your stuff sometimes the very first design uh props elements that they've experienced for the production Sometimes. It depends on what point of the production you're brought in at. Um, I've just recently been doing a little bit of work on Green Latin. Um, I can say I worked on it, but I can't tell you anything about it. But um, and that's, at the, that's at the blue sky stage. That's just like whatever. Just start coming up with ideas and, and invent stuff. Whereas when I got brought on to Alien Covenant, they'd been doing designs. Uh, other artists had been doing designs with Ridley Scott for, I think, of a year or more. And so by the time I got to it, a lot of things had already been established. So I was pretty much just putting the pieces together and reframing and composing and lighting and so on. So there wasn't a great deal of invention on my part for Alien Covenant. But some of the stuff I've just did for um, Green Latin, who knows, that may evolve and change over the, over the coming months. But it so it depends on the project and at what point you're brought in as that artist. Um, that's... It's creatively interesting and, and, and um, exciting, but it also terrifies me because it's that thing of invention and create stuff out of thin air, you know, and it's these paintings, these oil paintings that I do, I've got time to just sit back and relax and dream and, you know, I do some sketches and that might evolve over a period of months or weeks or years. But when you're doing concept art for a film project, they want to buy, you know, it's that old comic book saying, don't make it good, make it Thursday, you know. <laughs> So it's, um, you, you got to like turn that on and just go uh, invent, invent, invent. And sometimes you can't always do that. So you know, it's tough. I have a, I'm not I have complaining a question. Uh, did you, uh, you said you did Wolverine. Did, did you, I, I, I remember seeing the, um, the scene where uh, Nagasaki after the bombing, uh, did you do that? Uh, yes, one of the con yeah, one of the concept art pieces I did for that. I'm Very not sure nice. whether the wow. actual. Wow. I'm not sure whether the uh, shot in the film. There's a lot of shots in that film that don't m mesh up or don't look like the concept art, which is fine. It's totally fine. Um, that's just the director's particular style. They kind of they say, well, I just want to look and a feel and just get out everyone's head into roughly where that shot is or where that scene is. And then the reality of the day when they shoot or when they create it or when the visual effects are being done, it might look a little bit different. Whereas Ridley Scott, on the other hand, my God, he's like meticulous. Whatever that concept art is, that's what the shot is supposed to look like. So he's, he's very, you know, one of that, uh, the cathedral with that big round open doorway and the trees next to it. I think I did something like seven or eight different <laughs> versions of this painting because the trees weren't right. He just, I'm like, but it's concept art. We all know there's a tree going to be there. When you get to the visual effects stage, you can put the tree you like. Why do I have to get that tree right? I'm just sort of showing, yes, there's these trees that are roughly right. And they're like, nope, Ridley wants his trees just so. So, wow. whereas Wolverine, yeah, it's a little bit different, you know. Um, Wayne, uh, Padawan Learner asks uh, if you said what Sky Burial is. 
sky burial is a um, it's the term used for the uh, the Tibetans use that or they call a burial a sky burial is when they um, the spirit has gone from the body and then they recycle the body and they'll cut up a human body in these pits or these um, places and then they throw out the bits and you know what's left of the body bones and so on out to the buzzards and the, the dogs and whoever's going to eat it um, so it's this recycling of the matter the spirit's gone but the recycling of the matter so the sky burial series in my paintings is i've got this sort of loose story where there are some kind of sentient ai in those ships that may have i don't know somehow dissipated but they're dead so that's it's the same kind of thing you're pulling apart these ships the body of these ships into scrap into whatever just like the tibetans do with these um you know sky burials so in that story the people there believe or, or think that these ships have some kind of spirit because there was an ai they had some some level of intelligence very loose very loose idea but that's uh, that's where that came from wow um uh, we were, the painting we were just looking at before, Wayne, is is amazing. And um, uh, purple purple Valkyrie was talking about the detail. Um, can, can just because uh, I'm I'm not familiar. I'm I'm not somebody who's familiar with uh, extremely familiar with this um, uh, technically. What how how long are you spending um, on the detail in in a picture like in a painting like this? Uh, let's see. That one probably took. That was about a month. I was doing these, you know, in between other film work and so on. So that's mm. not that big. That painting's about a meter long. So it's about 40, 40 inches, I think. So it's not, it's not, it looks more detailed than it really is. Yeah, well, it looks, uh, <laughs> it looks pretty detailed. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Very it's detailed. Beautiful. All it's the little beautiful. people. I was looking at this closer, like when you see the the the, the people up with the ropes on on the ship. I mean, it's it's this it, it's such it's so beautiful to see. For me, it's so beautiful to see science fiction um, uh, represented in in this in a, such a traditional form of uh, art. It's it's beautiful for me. It's amazing. Well, that's kind of harkens back to a matte paintings that I loved so much i mean you know if you saw that as a, as a scene in a film obviously the characters in the foreground and that foreground sand dune would be real they'd be actors you'd have a camera set up mm -hmm. um, maybe some people in the background and then the rest would be a matte, a matte painting so i just always saw these as scenes in a film that obviously don't exist but i'd love to see exist i'd love to see you know on the screen but it's not going to happen so we don't do we don't do traditional paintings anymore. But that's just me getting <laughs> off on you know wanting to paint traditionally. So now, now let me ask you this: uh, Are you what happens when what happens if you get inspired now with certain things? Do you do do you just do you go off and do unsolicited things that are just because you're, you're inspired to do it? I haven't done any oil painting for since 2015. Okay. It's been a while since I last touched that project. Uh, I got. Some life things happened and I also got started to get very busy and I started to get a lot more film concept artwork. So it's just, and I moved out of the place I was living in. So I, and there I had a, a decent studio. Now I really don't, even though I've got the painting set up behind me with an easel, I actually haven't painted here since I've been in this apartment, but um, I'm starting to get the itcher back again. But I'm also interested in painting landscapes. When you're in, indoors sitting at a computer, I've got this giant 30 inch screen here and I'm locked at this desk, you know, hours and hours and hours every day and every week. All I want to do is get the hell outside and just, you know, do something else, breathe fresh air and paint trees and mountains, you know. Now, have you ever been inspired to uh, to write some to write a script of any sort to uh, to go in hand in hand with some of the art you're doing? Or is that not you? Like like I said, there was this vague sort of concept of the sky burial stuff, and I did have I do have an idea. I've got several ideas that I've sort of been throwing around for a little while. Nothing coherent, nothing particularly uh, concrete yet. But yeah, I, I'm dabbling, dabbling. Wow. But um, yeah, whether that, that ever sees the light of day, who knows? I might be able to paint, but right? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see.
When did you start drawing? Well, let's see, I was... <clears throat> year, year 9, I think it was year 9 or year 10 of secondary school, I actually stopped drawing. I'll give you that answer because for any of you young artists out there listening, don't be intimidated by someone else that can draw better than you because I let that happen to me. It was this guy in my class. The assignment was draw your name in a material, say like stone or metal or something, right? And I just drew my name in blocks of stone. One of the letters had fallen over, they're all chip, you know, there's cracks in the stone and so on. And I was pretty proud of that. And then I get to school, you know, the next day and there's this kid, Chris, and I'll never forget this because I, his name was drawn in this thing. Take a piece of aluminium foil, scrunch it up, unwrap it, and scratch the name Chris in that, and then draw that with a pencil, like every little facet, everything shaded absolutely perfectly. And I thought two things. One, technically I couldn't compete with that, and I couldn't have come up with that idea. So conceptually I thought he was way ahead. And that's when I started to think, maybe I should just do photography. Wow. And so I pretty much kind of let the drawing side of things drop away and then got right into the photography side of it which is in some ways a bit of an advantage because when I became a matte painter working in the film industry, well, photography is a big part of that. So, But I regret stopping that for many, many years. And it wasn't until I started, I guess, started working as a matte painter, I had to start to learn to draw again. And I'm still terrible. <laughs> That's a good life lesson, though, for, for everyone that you just... Uh... Right, because someone said to me um, years later, they said, well, his mum could have come up with that idea, you know, he could have gone, Mum, I don't know what to do. And she probably had a bit of foil. And she said, here, scratch your name in that. And there you go. Or, or she did it, scratched it, and he just copied it. You know, <laughs> yeah. how do I know? Yeah, I just story. assumed that was his idea and that that was his technique. Well, obviously, his technical execution, which is one thing, but the idea was the thing that, wow, that's, damn, wish I'd thought of that. You know, could have been anyone. Now, for example, um, for for a project, I, I was just really curious about about this one, um, Wayne. Uh, when you're when you're when you're involved in a project like um, like Maze Runner, um, where the the whole world is new, um, what what did what was your contribution there? The not that particular layout. But one of the major contributions I made to that film was the design of the poster inadvertently I did this I was working on the Wolverine and I did this tiny little sketch probably about that tall you know inch and a half of that looking across the top of the maze and looking down at that opening and the little people in the at the base of that doorway and I did that as a sketch because I got contacted by the director Wes Ball um, I don't know where he found me but he contacted me while I was it was my lunch break <laughs> sitting at the desk you know, doing Wolverine and I get this email and like yeah how's it going you know so he asked me to work on that I only managed two paintings for that first film, but I did that little sketch and that became sort of that first iconic poster, which was, uh, that was kind of cool. It's a tiny little sketch. And then for the no, second This one, is not it then, right? This is not the No, one. no, not that one. There's, it's kind of where you're high up, just above, like you're looking across the top of the, the maze, but you're looking right down and there's that, that gap, that opening. Okay. And you're I'm seeing some that, people at, the, up, at the base of that. And then they, the second film I did another painting which became also or they used a ver variation of that as this as the poster for the second film but i i didn't work on the third one i was ready to work on the third one and then what came up i think it might have been alien can't remember but um wow. yeah that was just coming up with again blue sky stage no real, no real ideas. Although Wes Ball, he um, he's got a short film called uh, Ruin, which is in sort of a post-apocalyptic world, and he did all this three D for it. He's quite a good an animator and three uh, D guy. So he built this these this whole world, and it, I knew it was going to be something like that. So I didn't have to. It wasn't a great stretch for what I, and I only did two paintings, so it wasn't a great contribution to that. Is this the one, um, Wayne? No, no, there's another one. There's another one? The, one of the very first paint, no. uh, very first posters that came out. I don't have the sketch handy. Or do I? Uh, no, it's in the sketchbook somewhere. 
Is it? Does it have? But does it have the people in the in the in the picture, or just the maze? Yeah, yeah. But they're really small. It's like they're way down the bottom. So we're oh, okay. similar sort of viewpoint. We're looking across the top of the maze, and where that opening is, that big door. You're sort of like looking way down. It's like a high viewpoint. Oh, down. I see it. I see. It. Okay, I think this is it. Okay. Um, but I because I, I was I thought that the um, I thought that some of the um, the concepts for for the Maze Runner were you know they were quite impactful. They they were impacting. Um, so. Oh, he he may have had a whole ton of other people doing stuff after the after the uh, the fact. I he brought me in just before uh, a few weeks before Christmas. I think um, uh, what year was that? Twenty twenty fourteen. I think from memory, something there. Twenty fourteen, twenty fifteen, and they messed me around with pay. They were going to pay. I should have been paid before Christmas, obviously. It's the kind of thing you want. <laughs> you need to be paid before Christmas. Yeah, it's sort of like that. That's not quite the one, but there's there's one like that. Oh, okay. And they messed me around with pay, and I was just having this damn, you know, constant email battle backwards and forwards between myself and the producer. And the director was kind of missing in action, and he was the one that hired me in the first place, and I really didn't have anything to do with the producers. But when it came time to pay, I was shuffled off to the producer, and they're like, well, you know, we'll, we'll sort you out as soon as we can. So I think I was too much of a pain in the ass for them. And they just said, oh, that's enough. We don't want to work with this guy. The director mm -hmm. did. He called me back for the second film. But I think that particular moment right through Christmas, I was like, come on, guys. This is, you know, it's not on. You know, you wanted the work. I delivered on time. I'd like to be paid before Christmas. Is that if it was any other time of year, be like, no big deal. It's OK. I'm happy to wait. But it's come on you know yeah <laughs> sure so, <laughs> like any other job right yeah but they don't take kindly to being you know getting into those sort of conversations yeah well our we have um we're we're friends with alan dean foster i think are you you're familiar with who he is yeah yeah and he's he's going through hell right now with, he hasn't been paid for his uh his books in years with, yeah crazy madness so. Unfortunately, the, uh, sometimes the creators come out on the losing end, or, or you know, and it, it, you know, I don't want to get focused on this because uh, I, we we know that Alan hasn't figured his stuff out yet with Disney. But um, if the, if if stuff like that is happening to people like Alan Dean Foster, what's happening to the little guy? So. Oh yeah, look, no doubt there was stories of visual effects companies that you know go broke and they don't pay people and games companies that do the same thing and i have to say once you get kind of signed into the process and you've signed your ndas and you've signed your contracts and all that kind of stuff and they've got payroll set up once they've got payroll set up you're kind of usually okay and then there's things just roll along and you get paid it's okay because you've got to put in time sheets and all that sort of stuff so they're very cut and dry that you know everything's taken care of but sometimes you just look through the cracks Sometimes they miss you, particularly if you're you know, from Sydney and you're not in the US or you're not in Europe. You are. I've, I've slipped through the cracks a few times. <laughs> you're waiting for pay. But for the most part, I just let it go. It's okay. I don't argue. But that one time I was like, yeah, come on, guys. You know. But as far as Alan's concerned, so this is the weird thing. See, now publishing as an author, he probably knows this. And I've done the odd book cover here and there. And the publishing industry is really on top of that whole rights thing. Like I did a book cover for um, an author here in Australia called Matthew Riley. And one of the uh, publishing companies, I think it was Orion in the, in the UK, published that, their version with my painting. So that was secondary usage rights. And what I, I was going through paperwork one time, and this was like a couple of years after the original hardback publication. And I went through the contract and it says, if we decide to republish this book as a soft cover and reuse your artwork we will give you 50 percent of that fee again and i'm like wow i didn't even notice that they were offering mm. free money should they republish that book and i went back and i went through the web and i had a look sure enough they republished it and i sent an email and they went oh we're so sorry we completely forgot and they just said please make us out an invoice and we'll send you the money so they that was in their contract they would pay me more if they chose to do something else with that book and use that artwork. And I found most of the publishing companies are really on top of that whole rights thing and that they absolutely pay their authors. But it's this weird Disney kind of 
author working for Disney or doing stuff that Disney is using material of that isn't. Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. I have no idea what his arrangements are, but yeah, there's, there's this weird middle place that he's caught in, I think. He's not working for a publisher direct, then he's not working, signed up to work with that film studio for a particular project. He's not on payroll. Somewhere he's, he's caught in between in this little black hole. It's nasty. Yeah, it's, an, it's interesting. Um, uh, I've been saying for the last year that, that sometimes it feels like, like Disney has only bought like a, like a license to use Star Wars and not really the product, you know. I don't know. Um, hmm. Well, that would in, I I'm not sure. I would imagine yeah. that they've bought copyright that they've acquired full copyright of, of Star Wars. But yeah, I, I really don't know how that would work as a as an author of other Star Wars material. I would imagine that should have all those boxes should have been ticked. But again, he may have slipped through the cracks. Now, have you ever have you ever taken your concepts, your original concepts, unsolicited original concepts to somebody like like that, to an author, to develop or, or an idea? Have you ever done anything like that? No, no, not yet. There's a couple of I did some um, covers for uh, the English magazine, a magazine called Interzone. And I through that process, I got to know a few of the authors that were submitting short stories and so on. And a couple of them sort of said, hey, listen, if you ever do anything, you know, hit me up and let me know. We can maybe, I can write, you can paint. So that's a possibility. We'll see. Hmm. But I haven't gone out with any of my material yet. I just don't have enough. I just, I do it when I'm free, when I'm not working on the film projects. And like I said, I haven't painted science fiction since 2015. That was the last one right there. Huh. So... I gotta say, I, I love this painting. That's that's inspired by two two artists, Ralph Macquarie. Uh, there's a book. It's not the Star Wars books. There's another big compendium of Ralph's work, and in I think it's one of the first pages. There's a, a vehicle. It's like a two three man size vehicle, and it's got treads. I think it's sort of got similar to that shape. It's reminiscent of that shape, and it's in grassland. And apparently it was one of the first paintings that George Lucas saw of Ralph's that, and there's a character in the foreground. It's sort of almost a stormtrooperish like outfit. And it was one of the paintings that inspired George to uh, use Ralph to, to do the work. So there's that. And then there's another painting um, or a couple of drawings and so on by Chris Foss. So it's a sort of an amalgam of those two artists that I really admire. Wow. Yeah, I got Stargate. Gorgeous. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, George is an artist. Uh, any comments on on on, on this painting? Uh, yeah, uh, in your mind's eye, I, 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 if it's, it's yes, is that's that the, the mail? No, 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 no just keep wait. going. I'm going. Okay, okay, okay. okay. All right, fine. Okay, in, in your, uh, how close? Uh, do, you, do you get in your mind's eye? Me, because I'm asking, because as I draw my stuff, I, I know at a certain point I, I say to myself, okay, I, I got to let this go because if I keep at this, it will be forever before I get my mind's eye on the, onto the page. Um, I did a small sketch of that first, uh, which was pretty close to that composition, actually. Uh, the proportions were all off, but at least the composition was pretty much there. Sometimes, they, as they say, they fall off the brush and they just kind of appear. Um, now, I will say that I'm not adverse to using 3D software when it comes to composing scenes like that because that's what I do professionally. I use 3D software, I use Photoshop, I use whatever I can to create that visual scene. How I get there is however I get there. Um, and one of the things I love doing with the film concept artwork is, I guess, the cinematography side of it it's my photography background coming in. And for that scene, I set up sort of the rudimentary model of the vehicle and just some basic blocks and shapes for the background. And then I set up cameras. Some cameras will have a longer focal length, some a wider focal length, and I just place them in different place, uh, areas to get a feel for that space. Because I want to use those vehicles again um, in other paintings and in other projects. So I'm not gonna try and redraw that damn thing, you know, over and over and over again. I just build it in 3D and then place that structure or the vehicle or whatever or where I need it. And then just do a sort of a loose drawing 
um, over that and then take it into the oil painting stage. And then from the, once it gets into oil painting stage, it starts to take on a life of its own and that's when things start to change and I can, you know, recompose on the fly or change lighting or things like that. That one, uh, that one seemed to sort of pop out pretty well, but others, uh, there's another painting uh, which I call Sky Burial 2. That I just rehashed over and over again, trying to get that to work, and I did lots of little sketches, and the sort of the main idea was there, but I just couldn't get it right. It just took ages to get that right. And then I ended up scrapping a painting that was about a meter wide. I threw it away, started again, I went much bigger, and flipped the composition. So, okay, um... You, you do realize you're, you're, uh, the scraps that you consider scraps are gold to us. And also, what 3D software uh, do you Maya. use? Maya. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So do I. No, that's not from Homeworld, by the way. None, none of this is ever. I also get asked, is that from, um, wow, what's that game? Damn. There's a vehicle. There's a six-wheel vehicle in another game. And I can't remember what it's called, but I keep getting asked, is that from that? But no, it's... This is this is a definite uh, little homage and inspiration of Ralph McQuarrie and Chris Foss, that one. But I've got that vehicle. I've actually done a uh, recently a small concept art uh, video tutorial uh, using that model in in a painting, and I'm going about to do another one actually. So I'll use it for many different things. Fascinating. These are just scenes I wish I'd seen, you know, I'd love to see in a film, you know. This one right here. That's for a, um, that was for a project that the, I mentioned the author I did a book cover for. Well, he wrote a script and that was some uh, early concept design for that. Obviously heavily, heavily influenced by, you know, Alien and that sort of thing. You know, dark, grey, brooding, you know space that's wow. old oh wow. is it yeah yeah that's um that's gonna be like 2010 i think that one uh wait what is ankaris uh does it mean it what does it mean that's it the first when i was doing my uh final year portfolio my photography portfolio, like I said, I was using 3D models, um, uh, plastic model kits, and, fo and photographing people and landscapes, and I'd composite them in Photoshop. And when I bought my first uh, Mac to do this work, just, I went and borrowed $15,000 from a bank, bought a brand new Macintosh, and a, and a monitor in Photoshop version 2.5, I think it was. So there was no layers, one undo, no, no Wacom tablet, just a mouse. And one of the, the you did that the with computer, a mouse. No, not that one, not that one. But my my original portfolio was all done with a mouse. Oh. And um, when I got the Mac, there was some demo software of a three D program called Infinity D. And so that's when I realized that I could start using 3D because I was going to build everything as miniatures and photograph them in the studio and, and composite it all together in Photoshop. But then I discovered 3D software and I was like, ooh. Anyway, so I put this scene together from a photograph that I'd taken in Turkey in the capital Ankara or Ankara. Uh, I was there way back in 1989. And so I used that shot, this afternoon sunset shot, and then built these towers in 3D and I put it in there and I called it Ankaras. So you know, it's a play on the word uh, Ankara or Ankara in Turkey. So that's kind of where it was. And that was the moment I realized that these tools, I could use these tools to create almost any sort of scene that I wanted to. It was like, that was proof of concept. It was like, yes, this is gonna work. This is, this is it. And I really kind of liked the name. So I just kind of kept it. It's the first cool. one. So. <laughs> Wayne, what about yeah. this image? Is This is digital, right? Yes. Yep. And and uh, the, how? Uh, what is this? Is from Alien Coven concept yep. art. Yep, yep. That's an alternative point of view. There's a uh, around. If you zoom back out again, just a little bit. There's there's those tall trees on the left, which don't really exist. None of those exist in real life. This is Milford Sound in New Zealand. But just around, if you were to so walk around that point where those trees are on the left, that's mm -hmm. where they shot the landing sequence. 
um, this was like an alternative landing point or viewpoint that they were thinking of doing. And so what wow. I did, I, I spent a lot of time um, using, uh, I suppose you call it photogrammetry, matching photographs. So that the basis of that was a photograph taken. There's a, where that was taken was the, uh, there's like a footpath and there's a bit of a car park where tourists just drive around and they just look out at that scene. So the, um, either the location person or the production designer snapped off that shot, very boring, horrible sky, very dull, um, nothing exciting, obviously no spacecraft and no fancy trees and none of that stuff, um, and no atmosphere. So I had to repaint it to, to make it look like that. But using the data from his camera and his position where he was standing, I could roughly match up in 3D where that camera would have been and mm. then put in that uh, shuttle. Because Ridley was absolutely pedantic about how big is this going to look in that frame? If I had a 24 mil lens, where is the shuttle and how big is it? Exactly how big is it? So I spent a lot of time match making sure I, my 3D cameras matched up to real world cameras. And so when I, wow. when I put that in there, he, he could look at that and say, oh, okay, cool. So if I shot that with a, you know, a 15mm lens or a 30mm lens, I know what to expect. Wow. Um, I, actually, you used, you used with, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm really impressed on the zoom in <laughs> on this. It's beautiful. Yeah, so there's a lot of, you know, some, there's some painting. I, I photographed, you know, tons and tons of skies. So... There's a lot of sky stuff up there that I've um, photographed from you know, storms and things. There's a storm around here today at the moment, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, obviously, it's painting. There's painting aspects. There's photo bashing. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So, what, um, Padawan asks, oh, what makes you choose Maya over, over uh, Blender, for example, or others for open source? Good question. Um, when I was working on The Fifth Element, I started using Alias Power Animator, which is the precursor to Maya. And that was on SGI and that was on the, the systems and it cost a, a mega bucks to, to use and to buy. But that's where I first started to learn series 3D. And then Maya came out well, while we were working on uh, Fifth Element, actually. Or they were showing us version one of Maya. And I guess over the years, I just kind of kept using that uh, system. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff um, I've seen in Blender. But at the moment... Maya allows me to play with the cameras and navigate through the take, what I call the taking camera fluidly and easily that the Blender camera, at least from what I've tried, I can't seem to get the Blender camera to compose the way I want it live. So I can't quite navigate and move and push in, pull out, lift up at the same time. And with Maya, I can do that really, really easily. And well, I've used George. it for so many years, so I kind of, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Uh, oh, and, and I was just going to ask George because I know George is on the paint. Do you have a preference on this, George? Uh, uh, my, uh, I, I live the life uh, uh, Wayne has lived. I, 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 I did spend money on a, on an expensive Mac, a 950. Um, I went from Mac 2 to a 950. Uh, also, I owned a Swivel 3D, and then I purchased uh, Infinity D. And right. uh, for, cool. for, the long, for the longest time, uh, I, uh, the studios that I worked at, they had Alias uh, software uh, in-house. In uh, I used it, and um, just it was it so six, seven years ago, I decided, you know what the heck, I'm just going to actually fork over the uh, exorbitant amount of money and actually buy the software. And it was a good thing because it, I bought the last version of Maya before they went into subscription uh, service. And I'm going like, whew, I just, you know, dodged the bullet there. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is also a Alien Covenant art, right? Yes. Wait. Yep. Yep. Wow. So that, that uh, the lander on the, on the right-hand side there, they built, uh, there are shots, probably shots you find on the web of the doorway, the ramp one engine module and sort of a, a part of the actual shuttle itself and the rest of it is just nothing and they just replace that in uh, cg in, in visual effects so again it's another um, process of where would that shuttle be um because that that area they're in it's like this tidal flat and the tides come in and out so they had to shoot most of it when the tide was out 
but they just wanted to know, you know, where was this going to be if we shoot from here, looking back in certain directions and all that sort of stuff. So it was very technical. A lot of the stuff I did for, for Alien was more tech, photographically technical than concept art, I suppose. It was just placing things in the right, right place and making them look, I guess, photographically believable as best I can. What they didn't show, so, hey, this is what I love doing. Um, the glowing engine is like those engines are going to be red hot. You know, you've got these flames coming out and it's landed, but they're still going to glow. And, you know, that metal is going to glow red hot. And you don't see that sort of what's the after effect once the ship's dropped. Maybe you see it here and there, but I, I hadn't seen it up to that point. So I thought that'd be cool. These things are going to be red hot. Wow. There's going to be a lot of steam coming off them and that sort of stuff. I don't know whether they end up having that in the film, though. God, it was annoying. Wow. I, I saw that film for free and I wanted my money back. <laughs> Jesus. Seriously. Okay, so this is my little thing, right? This is my little rant. <laughs> so you're in this group. You don't know Ridley, uh, uh, Ripley. You don't know that story. You don't know the Nostromo. You've, you're unaware of that whole thing. Except for maybe David, because he's the only guy that's been, you know, pretty, pretty warmed up to this stuff. So you're in this group and you're walking up this mountain, la di da, la di da. One, you know, the, the scientist and the soldier get left behind down down the bottom somewhere, and these guys climb up the mountain and they see the the derelict. Right, as far as they're concerned, as far as they're concerned, this is the first time humanity has ever made contact with an alien artifact or intelligence of any sort that we know of, anyway. At least in the from what I can tell of the law of alien. So they're up there and they're going, oh my God, and they're walking through, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they find the, you know, um, what's the name's diary or whatnot. But this would be mind blowing. This would be the most mind blowing thing you've ever seen in your entire life. This would just blow your socks off. And then they get the call from the guy downstairs, you know, from, from below. Go, oh, someone's so sick. I'm going to take him back to the, to, to the lander. Oh, no worries. We'll be back. We'll come down. We'll be there in 10 minutes. We'll be right along. No, you wouldn't. No way. You'd be like, I don't care, let him die. We've just found an alien space, a spaceship here. We're, we're not alone in the universe. Right. He can, he can die. We don't care. We're not coming down. We're staying up here. That's it. That would be end, end of movie. But they just go, oh, all right, no worries. We'll be down in a sec. Jesus. <laughs> what is your... Um, I, I, I know you're, you're, you're maybe not a hardcore uh, sci-fi fan, but what, is, what are your, some of your favorite um, sci-fi uh, franchises or uh, well, yeah, franchises? Well, Star Trek. Star Trek, most definitely. Yep. Star Wars, as I was saying to you guys before in the, uh, the, the beginning of this, um, I've still got every, the original Marvel Star Wars comic books. I've got the original, all the 107 issues in the uh, annuals. Wow. I've still got those tucked away in, in um, boxes. Um. And some of the Dark Horse stuff that came after that <clears throat> was pretty cool. But I wasn't, once I f discovered Star Trek, and I probably don't know as much of the lore of that as some of you guys, but I do love it. That's, that's the real, that's the heart of, I suppose, my, my fandom, what I'm interested in. I mean, I've, I just rewatch, you know, the original series, Next Gen, Deep Space Nine. I based my uh, maybe. morals off Jean-Luc Picard. Sorry? I based my morals off Jean-Luc Picard. Hopefully not the new one. No. no. <laughs> By the way, thank you for agreeing with me on that. Excellent. Yeah. I was going to say, do you have a favorite? But it seems like you've answered. Yeah. No, no, I, lo I love them all. They're great. They're just some, after repeated viewings of those series, you can just still find nuggets in there that you go, Oh, of course. I never thought of that. You know? So there's just so much in there. There's so much. I mean, the whole premise of, you know, say something like Starfleet, right? I'm going to get onto a little bit of an STD thing here. But hmm. how is it that someone like Burnham, who has these character traits that we're, is evidenced, is demonstrated through the last couple of seasons, if her character is flawed to the extent that it is. How did she get into Starfleet in the first place? She, exactly. she, she didn't just become that way. You can't. You can't establish a story. There must be backstory, regardless. And if a person is in that position at the beginning of the story, they must have been there prior to that story. 
and they must have worked their way through that process, any apprenticeship system, any training system. So how did she get through? It almost seemed like um, the like original make... Philippa Georgiou owed something to uh, Sarek and well, took her on. That's what happened. She didn't actually go through Starfleet Academy. Yeah, but uh, again, that whole, I don't think any of that makes sense because if she's... It doesn't. It doesn't. You better the whole try not to Living think on too Vulcan hard. and training with Vulcan? She, she has no character development because the very first episode she mutinies against her captain. And if you watch the very latest episode of Discovery, she mutinies against her captain. Well, that's a weekly occurrence. <laughs> and yet she's still the best person ever. Bestest ever. <laughs> Doom Punk does it. Wayne, uh, let me ask you this, because I, 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 I have come to the conclusion that um, all African American female protagonists in the new versions of Trek, they are all flawed in the same way, and none of them could have gone through, you know, made it through Starfleet Academy. I mean, I think it's a disservice to, to you know, to the African American female leads, to be honest. I'm still wondering how Tilly got through Starfleet Academy. Look, I, I think it's a disservice to anyone that's gone through any form of training of any sort into a profession, uh, whether it be art. Um, I mean, look, God, look at some of the crap coming out of DC and Marvel. I mean, where's that training of art skill? There's some comic book artists that just blow my mind in just sheer skill and, and talent. And I'm looking at some of this stuff thinking, thinking Jesus, I could actually, and I draw, my drawing of human figures is terrible. I think I could probably do a much better job than half these guys. But as a trained electronic technician for the Department of Defense, sure, you can joke around. You know, it's like the original Enterprise or the next gen guys. There was plenty of joking around. But when it came time to do the job, you were professional and you were trained to do certain things in a certain way. Mostly because there's safety issues involved. You know, if you mess up, someone dies or someone gets injured. And that sort of stuff was, um, you know, drummed into me as an electronic technician. As an example, one day where I worked was an ammunition factory. We made ammunition for the army, the navy, uh, the police, everything from 9 mil, 7.62, um, full four and a half inch shells for the navy, hand grenades. Wow. Uh, fuse, I worked in the electronic fuse section. I have a full top secret security clearance <laughs> from that from that job. Um, and there was one, there's one part, what they called the powder room. It wasn't one room, it was an entire area of the factory. And there were large embankments of earth built up around that section. And every single building had copper strips inside the rooms, around every hallway. And you had to wear these special conductive rubber uh, overshoes over your shoes and you'd be constantly walking around touching these um, copper strips to discharge any static electricity because the gunpowder almost becomes aeros aerosolized it, it just right. is fine it just floats in the air one spark boom it's all off <laughs> you just you know so you're trained to not do certain things or to take certain precautions and that doesn't happen overnight. You just can't get in there and have a one hour, you know, briefing. It's years and years of training to do certain things in a certain manner, in a, in a, in a way that's uh, efficient, clean, safe, et cetera, et cetera. I can't imagine some of the, the dangers that would be present on a, on a starship. You know, sure, they're technologically advanced, but there are still dangers. And I can't, I can't imagine they let these buffoons just <laughs> be in control of this stuff. Seriously. Vance seems to just let them do whatever they want. That Admiral Vance. It's, it just it doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I do work on my own car. I haven't let a, a BMW mechanic touch my car for the last, you know, seven, eight years. Oh, wow. And so I'm very conscious about how I jack the car up, how it's supported, secondary you know safety measures in case the jacks fail all that kind of stuff it this procedure just to fix your car 
you know, and if you mess up, if you forget one thing, like I did once, I forgot the handbrake and the thing rolled down the ramps and hit my little um, storage, you know, area and just wrecked the gate a little bit. It wasn't bad, but it was a mistake. And had I been behind the car, I could have broken, had my legs broken or I could have died. Just one little thing. It's just training, training. And how these bozos get into Starfleet yeah. and put in control of major systems Doesn't as, make a, sense. as as someone who's a navy veteran um i really wonder where the chain of command has gone in star trek discovery absolutely yeah yep yeah because yeah. Uh, the second season pike would be something like don't do that burn him that's an order and then burnham would say something to the effect of i do what i want and pike would just shrug it off that's not what a captain would actually do. No way. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was in the Naval Reserve Cadets when I was much younger. And so I don't have a full experience as uh, working, living or working in the military, but I was in that for three years and we did get to, you know, train on real Navy bases. And so, you know, even as a cadet, there was a train, chain of command. And I mean, look at, say, Voyager. It's not my super favorite, you know, of the whole series, but. There were times when Chakotay would disagree, you know, with the captain, with Janeway. Things that were morally really about to cross a line. And even then, he wouldn't cross that line. Right. Like the two Vicks thing. Yeah. And he was my... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, it's just if he had a, a, an issue with anything, they talk about it in the ready room. They hash it out. They'd settle it. And they'd settle it and he'd just have to say, okay, well then I'll, I have to support you, you know? Right. And he used to be a Maquis and they were so far away from the Federation and they still, do, yep. you know, follow things to the T. Yep. Yeah. They didn't exactly. fight it. They didn't fight amongst each other much. Right. Exactly. I mean, there was the, I think there might've been the odd episode where there was a little bit of a, uh, a mild yeah. mutiny. But yeah. Boy, That's you, they had to yeah. really, really, really be something seriously on the line for that to happen. It wasn't. Uh, did something. I remember Belana doing something to where Janeway was like, "If you ever disobey my orders again, I'm gonna demote you." Yeah. Yep. There's consequences. Wayne, uh, um, Gap Stargate asks um, if you have you ever watched Dark Matter or Stargate. Do you enjoy those? I, to be honest, I haven't seen much of Stargate, to be honest. I, re I remember the original film, but I don't remember seeing a lot of the um, TV series. Um, and I did watch Dark Matter, though. Uh, it's a shame that that, uh, that didn't continue on. I was sort of starting to get a little bit hooked into that. Did you watch all three seasons? I think so, but this was a few years back, so I, haven't, I don't really remember too much of it, okay. except that I just wished it had it continued on. And the other thing I would love to have seen, could you imagine Dark Matter with the budgets that discovery have oh oh wow the yeah, sets the design of the that just mind-blowing i don't know if you're aware of this but we do uh we do dark matter uh monday review every monday with with uh joe malazzi the creator of dark matter yep yep and um uh you're welcome to join us on a monday if you want Wait. i'd have to brush up on the show <laughs> that is nothing good to contribute in, with that but yeah I, I thought it was a really good show it was just really starting to go someplace and yeah. I, I really enjoyed it um yeah. i wanted to put up a, this image uh wayne is from oh wait this is the right one yeah this image is from the second movie correct of the uh uh yes second Razor, maze runner film yep yeah, that was just uh, in the story, I believe. It's the main character ends up in these tunnel systems and he's with this other um, girl and they get separated from the rest of the group. And it's just, you know, um, old subways and so on and the tunnels have collapsed and there's debris everywhere. How, how long is it, just out of curiosity, how long is it taking you to, to work this, this image out, uh, if, you, if we may ask that? Uh, it varies. And it's that may have been say three four days, mm. and that includes any feedback from the director or the production designer. Uh, they might say, "Oh, more of this, less of that," you know, um, make it look colder, you know, that sort of thing. 
add more of this, take that away. But yeah, that's at the longest. I think the I did some uh, painting for foundation, first season foundation, which was about two and a half weeks. That was a big, quite a big epic scene, epic painting. I actually painted it at quite high res too, which didn't help. <laughs> but um, it it depends on the scene. So, so at fastest. I think one of the paintings I did for Ghostbusters was about two and a half days. But it can go up to like two and a half weeks, depending on how much how much is in that scene. How much 3D wow. is involved. If it's an interior scene in 3D, I have a real hard time rendering that, you know, in any reasonable time frame because of, it's the way the shadows are calculated and to get an image that's smooth and not too noisy, it uh, takes a bit, of, uh, a bit of effort from my, my Macintosh. I don't have a PC, so my doesn't... The Mac and Maya, I have to use the processors to render, not the graphics card, so it's a little bit slower. But uh, yeah, it depends. Depends on the scene. How much of it's painting versus how much is 3D, you know, how much can I photo bash in there? Which a lot of that is photo bashed with a little bit of 3D, so that was probably pretty quick. Hmm. Well, what, are the, what advice for, do you have for somebody who's, somebody who's starting out now in, in this field? I mean, Buy real what estate. You, what would you say to them? <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard, it's a hard slog. I feel super, super fortunate. I don't know how. I'm not sure I would have managed to get the work. If I was starting out today, I'm not sure I would have got the work. It's too many, too much competition, and there's a lot of, lot of excellent, excellent young artists that absolutely phenomenal. Um, I think I was in the right place at the right time. It's just that now I've just had longevity. I've been around for a long time. But having said that, if I was starting out, what advice do I give? You have to, you have to create, I believe, this is my opinion, create the sort of art that you would like to create first and let the industry that's interested in your work find you. Because these days everyone's got a website or you can put your stuff on ArtStation and so on. So there's sure. plenty of ways for people to find your art. And the thing is then, who decides to find you? Now, if you're hell-bent on working on a games company, then obviously you're going to create work that's reminiscent and looks like games work. So then do that. If you love watercolor and you're painting little characters in watercolor, you might be you know, prime target for doing children's book illustrations, you know. Uh, but if you're doing what, little characters and cute characters in watercolor, but you want to be a concept artist or you think you should be concept artist, you might actually have more success doing something else, like for the publishing side of, of uh, art. So it depends. I, I'd say just follow, the, follow your passion in terms of the type of work you want to do rather than, I think I need to do this sort of work for this industry. You know, hmm. that's where for me, it was always my original love of those map paintings and those big epic scenes. I just wanted to create that. <laughs> that's a, a good point. One. Yeah, yeah. This is yours, right? Uh, yeah, that's that, one of the things by the end of them. Um, I think I finished up working in the art department on Alien Covenant in uh, July, I think it was. And then from July to November, I worked as the visual effects concept artist on Covenant. So everything had shifted to London and they were sending me actual footage and I would paint into that shot. So wherever the green screen or the blue screen was, then just paint that stuff out. Now in that particular shot there, there was a David is wearing that cloak, not in this particular painting, because obviously I've added Gandalf and the, and the hobbits, but in this particular shot, David's wearing this cloak and he looked like a hobbit. And I was like, all right, time to have a bit of fun. So I did the shot I had to do with David and I, some dude with a radio or whatever and, and the background. And then I did this version. Now, what we did in the art department then was to get these images printed out. So there was a stack of prints and that was put into the pile and put on the production designer's desk. And he was, at this particular moment, he was late and he had to run off, take those prints and go into a meeting with Ridley Scott. And I was just hoping that he was going to grab the pile run and then start putting them up on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he intercepted it before he, uh, he left. He quickly went through them and went, 
Wayne, what's this? Oh. <laughs> I was like, ah. I said, you can at least leave it in there. I said, you can at least show him, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, that was my little, um, my little homage to uh, Lord of the Rings. Now, you mentioned Star Trek. Um, have you gotten a chance to watch The Orville, Wayne? Yes, yes. Awesome. I love it. Wonderful that's, show. That's great. It's just witty and it's... I thought it was just a big piss take, but it, you know, it sort of starts that way. And I suppose there's moments within each episode where it's a little bit of a piss take, but it's actually pretty deep and there's some strong story. It's just really good characters and you start to really get into it. You know, it's like, wow, this is really, really cool. I was very, very surprised. Mind you, I'd heard tons of good things about it. So it was, uh, it was nice. It was nice and refreshing. Wow. So I really... You would nice definitely that, work for them if they called you? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and that seems to be, I'm getting most of my work with TV series at the moment, so even though I just came off working on Dungeons and Dragons, which is a film, um, everything's going streaming, so it's a TV series. Wow. So after Ghostbusters, I did the uh, first season of Foundation. I'm on the second season of Foundation right now. Uh, I've just done some stuff at Green Latin, which is a TV series, a new one. Um, I'll probably go back to that at some point as well. I did a... <laughs> I got called to work on the European, the US slash European um, version of War of the Worlds. Have you guys seen that? Really? I've seen. I, I have seen a little it's bit. It's on uh, Epics, I think. I watched uh, several episodes. There are these little kind of dog things walking around, you know, in London, and there was some big like I can't remember what happens, but pff, most people die on the planet, and there's a few people left. And so I got called to work on that. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. War of the Worlds. That's a nice, you know, interesting uh, project. And then this producer says, great, Wayne. Uh, we only need you for five days. So I managed to do like one painting and a, and a little bit of 3D modeling for something. And then that was it. So I was like, yeah. Oh, wow. Anyway, I'm not complaining. Um, is, <laughs> um, is there, uh, this, is, this is just another... Um, just amazing, uh, just amazing artwork. What is this from? Um, That's the you know? uh, video tutorial I've got on my Gumroad page. Um, so for you know, concept students of concept art who want to become concept oh. artists and so on and work in the industry, I've got a whole video process of how I built that or, or did that did that painting. So it's a combination of three D. So as you can see, there's those those uh, rovers uh, which I built, which was the basis of the original painting, that oil painting. And this is just uh, one of the aspects of working as a concept artist, and this was true of the Alien uh, project. There are, in the art department, you've got a whole bunch of set designers, and they're using CAD software, and they're designing set pieces. And then they'll give that to me. So I either use that set piece in its entirety, or I build and extend onto that set piece, and then turn it into what I call the photographic reality. And so that's what this tutorial was about, was the assumption that I was given those models and then I've got to put it into a scene and make it look like it's you know some scene from the film so I just go through how I did all that and there's a you know, little bit of painting and some applying textures to base 3d and so on in the end I it looked more like a box cover art I did a version there's a version of this somewhere with the tutorial that's all you know looks like an old faded box cover as if there was a model plastic model kit in there Wow. Uh, Gap Stargate asks, where did, I'm, I'm not sure what he's referring to. I may have missed the, the point. Uh, where did levitation come from in your mind? Oh, that's one of my other uh, oil paintings. Um, oh, okay. That was a, started as a little watercolor sketch that I did in New Zealand. I think I was just starting to work on Lord of the Rings. And I just was just sketching this little thing one, one, uh, one night. And that might have actually been, I think I was looking at some Sid Mead, actually. And then this sort of thing came out. And then... 10 years later, 15 years later, I eventually <laughs> painted that, that levitation painting. But that's somewhat wrapped up into the same story as the other, the ship breaking. It's all, it's all somewhat connected, loosely. Like most other neurons in my brain, loosely connected. Wow. Um, now, um, is there, is there what's, on, what's on your bucket list that you want to do uh, professionally, Wayne? Is there Ooh. stuff that's... 
had you asked me this, you know, when I, maybe 10 years ago, I would have said maybe Star Wars. Uh, I'm not sure about that anymore. Star Trek, there was the production designer that I worked for on Dungeons and Dragons recently, he was about to uh, head up the, the art department for the Star Trek sometime early this year here in Sydney, but that disappeared. That was the first I'd heard of that. Had that happened, I would have been very happy to work on Star Trek. At least I have that, you know. But it would have to be the right Star Trek. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Um, do you no, guess, there's uh, nothing, nothing that I can think of. I mean, I'd love to continue doing my science fiction paintings and publish a book, you know, a big... Um, what do you call it? large picture book with a story in it that would be uh something i'd love to do just to get that done wow have you ever thought about or have you ever contemplated doing uh the working directly in the comic book industry and not really i've got an idea for those those rovers those six-wheel vehicles i've got an idea for a world that where they're set into that as a, po a potential graphic novel but again these are just kind of ideas just floating around and you go, oh, that'd be cool. That'd be interesting, you know, but the reality of working in the film industry, you know, six days a week, most for the most part. And then when I finish that, I want to get out and I want to go paint landscapes, you know, go out, jump on a four wheel drive and just go out and go bush, you know, so <laughs> I kind of, uh, it's that constant pull. Uh, by the way, the Padawan Learner, uh, was to, um the comment uh wait he had put in um uh, he said someone showed you showed how you can operate blender camera in shooter mode and he says it's not exactly what he what he um was looking for but he posted a link here okay in the chat so if you could forward that to me that'd be great uh, I mean, I know you can look through the Blender camera and you can sort of orbit around the shape, um, at least with the controls I had, I wasn't able to get the same fluidity that I get in Maya. So, but there's a ton of things I use in Maya that I use every day and yeah, you just know the tool. So it's, I'd have to go through and, you know, like really learn Blender to get it to a stage where I can use it professionally, where a client can say, can I have that, you know, a version of that in two days, I need to be completely fluent with that that software so i have to use what i know because the clients are depending on me so yeah um time i just wish i had more time <laughs> more life fucker <laughs> how's the weather out there by the way you're you're is it hot now uh yeah it's probably about 30 odd degrees celsius outside at the moment uh, looks like there's a storm coming They've been tipping that for today. I'll tell you how hot it really is. That sounds nice. <laughs> well, in Sydney, it gets a little humid. I'm not a big... I grew up in Melbourne where it's hot but dry. Here it's hot and humid. Yeah, it's only 25 at the moment, so it must, the temperature's dropped a bit. I and I wanted to go ahead and show your website too. Um, do you guys, while I do this, does anybody have any questions for Wayne? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, how can uh, people uh, get in touch with you? What, what are your, all your social media? Uh... Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I don't use it very much. Um, I've got a website, which I think PJ is probably going to show, uh, yeah, ncaris.com. Um, most of my work, more of my work can be found on my ArtStation page, ncaris again, uh, at ArtStation or whatever it is. Um, I've got a YouTube channel which I started recently because I want to get some more of these sort of tutorial things going and show our process and so on and so forth. But again, that's, you know, the, the YouTube alg algorithm must just ignore me completely because I just don't do anything with it. So I'm going to be one of these terrible YouTube guys who just don't put anything up for months and months. And then in between jobs, I'll be able to put something up. But uh, yeah, it's just there for fun. Shits and giggles, you know. I, I think I'm on, yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram, but I don't do anything with that either. I'm slack when it comes to <laughs> social media. I had a question I, I, a little a little outside what we've been talking about, but but if you don't mind, 
Uh, you mentioned you were a elect electronics technician for the Department of Defense. And earlier, uh, before we started streaming, you also mentioned you were an Exozone fan. Yes. So yeah. I have to yeah. ask, is there anything you've seen or... There's nothing I've seen in my professional capacity, put it that way. No alien. Okay. No, definitely not. Definitely not. No, where I worked was just, it was an ammunition factory. Um, I suppose at the time they had, you know, electronic fuse systems that were secret uh, that we worked on that I really barely remember. So this is not like I'm going to be giving any secrets away. There was a department that as an apprentice, we went through these different departments to learn different skills. And one of them was called Fuse Development Lab, which I never got to. That was even secret for me, even though I had a top secret security clearance. I never got, in, got into that particular um, department for six months training there. So uh, what they did in that place, I have no idea. Um, but in terms of have I seen anything? Uh, I've seen plenty of things in the sky that don't make a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I've seen lights, you know, like what appear to be satellites, you know, just appear, move and then make a left hand turn and that sort of thing and then blink off. Um, I've seen plenty oh, of those weird. sorts of things. More of that uh, spritzy? That was the last one was awesome. Um, right there? Yeah. Oh, there's a sure. series of. Uh, oh, okay. There's an open mic. There's a series of videos by a guy named um, Secret NASA Man on YouTube. He was a Canadian uh, TV broadcast producer. And he, back in the 90s, he was um, basically recording everything coming off the shuttles, the, the NASA shuttle missions. They didn't realize people could record it back then. So he was, he could adjust the uh, satellite dishes of the TV studio and then just record. He just recorded thousands of hours of their missions. And there's all sorts of stuff on those videos that are just mind blowing because it's uncut. It's just straight NASA stuff. Wow. Um, and a lot of it is from their, uh, their UV sensitive cameras. Now, People look at this stuff and they go, oh, it's black and white, it's grainy, as if NASA would use these shitty, you know, black and white cameras. It doesn't make sense. But it makes complete sense if you actually understand that they're using uh, UV sensitive cameras. And some of the stuff that appears, I mean, literally materializes within frame and moves and it's like, right, that's very interesting. Something is invisible to a UV sensitive camera, then becomes visible, or at least the UV energy of it is visible to the camera but wasn't prior. And it's not ice particles or any sort of crap, but there's some good videos. Look for the one called uh, The Smoking Gun. I think it's from the mission STS-88, The Smoking Gun. That, and about the three, three minute 50 mark, I think is pretty full on. It's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. So knowing that the government, you know, works and has top secret programs and so on and so forth, it makes sense that there's, you know, stuff that we don't know about what it might be who knows you know until they actually come down and knock on our front door and say hi we're here <laughs> but uh yeah i love all that sort of it's just you know as an artist you kind of imagine all sorts of scenarios and things so there's there's room for that visual visual exploration as well um i wanted to show uh, i wanted to show um ankaras.com Mm, this is the uh, um, yep. what Wayne's, uh, and I'm going to show the art station too. Um, this is a nice little uh, painting here on the cover, and um, what I was at your portfolio page is is beautiful. It's uh, some of the things we looked at. Yep. Uh, I'm sorry. Were you were going to comment on the painting before? Wayne, oh, sorry. no, just that that was a, one of my um, outdoor, you know, plein air um, landscape paintings. So I did that uh, uh, on site. <clears throat> That's another challenge. I bet it was so, a photograph from what I can see, but I'm a few feet away from the screen. So. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's probably my matte painting training sort of coming in. So up close, it's quite painterly. But when you if you step back far enough, it'll probably resolve itself as more photographic. It certainly does. 
Wow. Yeah, it looks a lot more photographic from back, uh, if you look back further. I wonder if I can, hang on, if you just bear with me, I'll go get that painting and I'll hold it up to the screen so you can see the actual oh, painting. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah, Very yeah. Cool. PJ, put him on full screen so we can see it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to do that when he gets back. Wow. Now, it's, n it's not as... um. The version on the website is probably the correct color. It's probably looking a little bit dull and it's not in focus either, but. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Where is that's that? Wait. Oh, that's um, about three hours out of Sydney. It's just a small, small dam, small uh, little lake. Very interesting. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, so I'd like to do more of that if I could. And and you also uh, we can also purchase artwork uh, from Wayne on the on his website on his website. And oh, and uh, it takes you yeah, to yeah, not directly from uh, my website because I don't have any of that. Yeah, e -commerce it takes you to the, uh, that's right to this link. And um, yeah, some some beautiful and you can get a print of this one that we were looking at before. Yeah, Dust I sell prints, prints of most of the uh, paintings, and I also sell the original paintings too. Wow. Oh, this is a Gabriel one. Then. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that, that one hasn't sold yet, but some of the others have sold. Like that one with those the six-wheel vehicle, that one and uh, Sky Burial 2 sold together. That was a nice, that was a good day. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had, now, have you ever had your stuff uh, in a gallery exhibited? I had the, if you go back to... Um, the portfolio page, it's got the Sky Burial 2 painting. That'll, should appear soon. Uh, Which one is second, it? Second, on, second down on the left. This one? Yeah, that's the one. There's a annual book put out um, wow. called uh, Spectrum. I think it's just, what is it? Spectrum, fantastic illustration. Spectrum 27? Yeah, Spectrum 27. I'm not sure. What, I can't remember what number it was, but it was one of the. Might have been twenty or twenty-one or something like that. Um, yeah, from by uh, Fl uh, Flesk uh, pr uh, Publications. Right. It was before they were Flesk. And oh, okay, okay, yeah. um, Greg, uh, illustrator in America, one of the probably one of the best illustrators in America at the moment. Um, he was uh, curating an exhibition at the Society of Illustrators in New York, and he chose that one. At the same time, th that's right. This would have been twenty fifth. 2014 that's right yeah 2014 wow. and at the same time i was actually exhibiting i did take my work to america and i went to um the iluxcon exhibition in uh, allentown in pennsylvania so while i had the the bulk of my paintings exhibited there that one was sitting in the uh in the society of illustrators in new york and i think that was also used for uh, what's the gallery named there was another exhibition in New York, and I can't remember what it is now. So yeah, it's it's not not a lot, just a little bit here and there. And th this is before Disney Star Wars. Yes, because yeah. because that, that that is such such a wonderful inspirational uh, piece. There, there's so much, so much more character than a scene a single star destroyer, uh, you know, stuck in the sand. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I just Disney Star Wars sucks, but you know, I, I, when I saw a star destroyer in the sand, okay, you know, it, it's what it is. But there's so much more character to to this illustration uh, of a massive of a massive ship, uh, you know, in the sand than what we got out of a billion dollar corporation. Yeah, I got asked by a couple of friends uh, after that first uh, The Force Awakens came out. They said, oh, you, did you work on Star Wars? I said, no. They go, why do you ask that? I said, oh, because of the Star, Star Destroyer in the sand scene. I said, no, 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 I didn't work on that. Who knows whether it was they seen some of this stuff as, you know, used it as inspiration. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. But in these, these paintings here, the story is that these are 
they've dismantled, say, most of the ships, or to some degree, what was valuable to them, and then they leave them. And that there's, you know, communities, or I suppose you could call villages, that live in one of those ships. You know, so they're not, they don't just strip them down to absolutely nothing, but they'll leave them there. And, you know, perhaps live in them, and there's, you know, societies and communities around these, uh, these derelicts. That makes so much sense, too. Yeah, because, like, if you're out there in, in such harsh conditions, um, you want a place where you've got shelter, you know, and exactly. some, of these, some of these might have, like, really big uh, cargo holds that they can grow stuff in, and, you know, maybe some of them have big water tanks, you know, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I wanted just... to show... Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying, it's just, it's fun to ma imagine all that stuff, you know, what's there and what's going on and how do people live and that's, that's part of the uh, creative process. And I wanted to show uh, real quick your art station page as well. And um, that's beautiful, by the way. Um, well, let me put it up. Um, would you say this? The, yeah, you have a lot of stuff on here, right? On uh, your yeah, except for the, I think I'm probably. Well, there's obviously Ghostbusters. What was the last thing? What was before that? I'm not sure what the latest stuff. Oh, was that uh, tutorial? Well, Alien Covenant is probably the last professional work that's I put up there. Everything that's come out after that. Uh, or everything that I've worked on since then is either because I did some stuff for Pixar. Mm. One of the production designer that I worked with on the Wolverine, he was tasked with getting a small group of um, artists together to do a little. Pixar were exper experimenting with outside artists. There's a project that they were working on, and they just wanted to see what other people would do, and so it was a, a small band of us, and we did some work and. Whether that ever gets made by Pixar, who knows? But I can't show it. So, sure. Until they decide to eventually make it, if they decide to make it, maybe I'll get to show it one day. But I'm tempted to put it up as, you know, Project X, Untitled Project or something like that. Uh, well, let's see what else. Oh, there was a Merlin. Ridley Scott was going to do Merlin. That was, I did that after Alien. That's right. And this this will interest you. That went for six weeks. I was on that for about six, six, seven weeks. And they pulled the pin on that project because Solo lost money. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We've, all heard, we've all heard that phrase before, haven't we? So, so if, a, um, if you do artwork for a concept art for, for something that, uh, say, never uh, comes to light... That means you're never going to be able to show that concept art? Theoretically. It depends on the production and it depends on what the uh, NDA agreement is. Okay. All but right. I think if it just, I don't know. Uh, I, want to, I want to expand on that question. Is there anything that you can't show that you've done in the past because of legal issues that it, it could be so awesome, it, it, you know, all of us would be geeking over? <laughs> I'm not sure about peeking over. My work is is not exactly flashy. I don't consider it to be flashy, exciting work. Um, I, I think I think we all disagree here on the panel. Well, <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess I guess compared to you know, someone that does a, does a painting of you know Jedi's fighting or something like that. You know, mine's just the set, it's the location, it's the landscape, and you know, my, I like to get nice lighting and interesting you know drama in the scene, but. I don't consider it particularly flashy. Yeah, you, um, you, know, you, know, you know, I have to, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I have to disagree with you for, for, uh, on, on, uh, <laughs> on, on just the principle alone, okay? I mean, to, right. to, 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 to set up an environment, to, to, to set up an environment that a story will actually live off of, that's, that's extraordinary work, sir. Well, thank you. It's a big part of world building. Yeah, true. Yeah. True, and yeah. that's the, I guess that's the sort of the side of things that I really enjoy, but um, I don't know. Maybe I just don't. It's for me. It's just kind of what I do, and I enjoy that side of it. But it's not f 
I just don't see it as flashy, particularly. So yeah, you, you know, a, a couple of Jedi's, uh, a painting of a couple of Jedi's fighting. Okay, that's that's such a minute microcosm. But when you when we see in whole environments that we that we can imagine stories uh, are going to unfold mm. uh, in there, that that's that's just extraordinary. Hmm. This this image right here, by the way, this like screams Stargate at me, really. <laughs> I love the guys. Stuff <laughs> this guy. It's like, uh, wow! It's like the things and the jackals and all the obelisks. It's great. Yeah, yeah. That that was from that um, that little known art house film <laughs> called Gods of Egypt. It was a film. Yeah. Oh, you never seen it? No, no. Oh, you're in for a surprise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, what's that guy? The guy who uh, was the star of uh, that Spartan movie, 300? Yes, yeah, he was the, he's, um, uh, what was the uh, character? Damn, who's the opposite? Uh, Seth. Seth? Yeah, yes. Seth. Yeah. He's the bad guy. Yeah, it's like a buddy movie. It's, um, it's so bad, it's kind of good. It was just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the end, at the end of the movie, it just became way too cartoony. For, oh, for its, for its just project. just the end of the movie? Wow. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, when I, when I saw it, I got like, wait a minute, I saw something more awesome than this before, and then I thought back, oh yeah, Immortal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the French movie. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. Don't know that one. Oh, it, it's it's a uh, it's similar in theme, but uh, the the gods of Egypt uh, sort of came to New York, uh, uh, futuristic New York. It's, okay. It's uh, really well done. It, w it was produced by the actual artist who, crea right. who created it. It's, it's like Akira. It was produced, oh, by, okay. cool. was produced by the creator. Immortal was produced by the actual creator. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and a lot of the, the, the way uh, your, your designs for this setting here, it, it ha it, there's a touch of elements in that in that movie. Yeah, I guess. Look, there's also um, years and years of you know looking and reading Mobius comic books and European science fiction comics and heavy metal and all that stuff. There's always uh, it's always there. It's an influence, and I love it. Um, Al Williamson's comic books, you know, the original Star Wars, some of the original stuff in the original Star Wars comic books. Yep. There's just those, some of those worlds. I guess they just percolate around and eventually they just come out, you know, and I don't necessarily think about it. Uh, you guys might know, well, I don't know if Wayne knows this, but they're, they're close to bringing new Stargate back. And uh, uh, Gap, Gap Stargate. You can go online and 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 leak this image as the as the new uh, Stargate <laughs> <laughs> concept. <laughs> I'll, re kidding, I'll repaint it. I'll put a Stargate where that doorway is. There's just yeah. a doorway it go leading into that <laughs> that crypt. But I'll put a Stargate there just for we're, hell. We're yeah, all it like, would legit be perfect. It would. No, be okay. That this really... sort of leads me to something I should point out because a lot of people see um you know when these concept art pieces are leaked. No disrespect to anyone anyone, but what happens is that they get picked to, to the, you know, like with a fine tooth comb and people see little things and they go, that must mean this, that's that, that's going to be this in the, this whole story, you know, spins out of this concept artwork that's been leaked online. And half the crap that I put in, you know, my concept art has nothing to do with that sort of stuff whatsoever. It's just shit that I like putting in there. Like one of the Wolverine paintings, I've got the, um, the biplane from Raiders of the Lost Ark flying in the background. Ah, That's all. Nice. You know, I just throw <laughs> shit in there that I like that I have fun with, but there's no real necessarily meaning that, at least, unless we're directed to put something like that in, that is a definite story point. But there are so many things in concept art that is just incidental to the the way the artist has created it. So don't get too caught up in the details of what might be in concept art if it's. Oh my! Oh my gosh! That's incredible. You know, if you ever get a chance to work on any kind of dinosaur movie. Uh, uh, do, uh, doing environments, uh, please just somewhere in, in there on, on a stone face, just uh, put the inscriptions Fred loves Wilma. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like the R2D2 and C3PO um, hieroglyphic in the um, behind the yeah. Ark of the Covenant. Exactly, the exactly. You get it. You got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> it, it's like yeah. having the Millennium Falcon in uh, one of those White Star Trek battles. Yeah, it's the right. <laughs> yeah, and used as a building in Blade Runner. So this is the cool thing about Wick on the Fifth Element. The guy who was my uh, visual effects supervisor, Mark Stetson, he was the lead model maker on Blade Runner. And Star Trek, the motion, I don't think it was the lead model maker on Star Trek motion picture, but I think it was one of the model makers, but he was definitely the lead model maker on Blade Runner. So I met some very, very cool people that have worked on some really, really cool stuff when I worked on uh, at Digital Domain. I was very, very fortunate. Wow. And he became the visual effects supervisor on Lord of the Rings. So that's how I got, while I was doing Farscape in Sydney, he came over because he'd been based in New Zealand at that point. And then he came over to Sydney looking around for people. And he said, um, well, when, you're, when you finish here, come on over. And I was there about a month, two months, and then he got fired by Peter Jackson. I'm like, who the hell fires the guy that was the lead model maker who was the VFX supervisor on Fifth Element? Who fires that sort of guy? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. Oh. I, these these exi these images were used exactly in the uh, in the movie, I think, right? Uh, the second one you're scrolling down to became uh, the poster. They did a variation on that uh, as a poster, but I don't know whether they were like you know exactly detailed. Well, they, detail. look, they look very familiar. That's all. But yeah. Again, it depends on what um, the director wants and. Some of them just say, well, let's just get this in the ballpark. And then by the time it gets to the shot and they shoot, um, their locations may have changed. Uh, the visual effects process may, may alter. They may have, it may have changed, you know, their idea of what the shot will look like. Um, but like Ridley Scott, I said, he's very pedantic and once the concept art is done and that's sort of, that's the map, that's the template for the shot. And it has to really, he keeps it quite, quite tight. By the way, getting back to Stargate, Wayne, um, our whole community is very excited because they're very, they, they're close. They're close to getting a new Stargate. So any Stargate inspirations, like any Stargate like inspirations that you might have, who knows? Who knows if there's work for you there? Maybe. Um, like I said, there's a lot of, you know, TV, TV work going around at the moment. And I suppose one of the benefits of this whole COVID thing is that artists like myself have been trying to convince the, the, the film industry that we can do our work from home that I can be anywhere yeah. in the world and I don't have to be in the US, I don't have to be in England. I can be in my apartment and I can paint what I want or what Logical. you need, you know? And it's just, it's just easier. So that's been great because like I said, I've just um, did a little stuff for Green Latin, first foundation, uh, now working on the second season of foundation. So it's, it's pretty cool, yeah. But I hadn't heard of the Stargate. So that'd be, that'd be interesting. PJ, can you go back up a, a, a backup page? There, yeah. there's, one, there's one illustration I'd like Wayne to comment on. Which one? The one, uh, the one on the far right. This one? Yeah, uh, the other right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. The other right. Yeah. <laughs> this one. Yeah. Uh, Wayne, uh, when, when I saw this, the, I mean, the whole panoramic shot, can you yep. speak about this? Uh, that one, well, that's like I said, I did a small watercolor sketch one day while I was in New Zealand. Um, I think it was a Sunday afternoon, just small watercolor sketch, uh, sort of like that. And then that eventually became, I, that particular version there became uh, one of the covers for Interzone magazine, English magazine. Yes. And that was a little bit of a, sort of a, a pre-design or a, um, what do you call it? I suppose a, a rough for the larger, more panoramic version. Wow. But it's, it's just, again, some of those engine or uh, ship pieces that have just been kind of, you know, bolted together and it's sort of this levitating, hovering thing in this chasm. Wow. So I kind of like those sort of desert worlds and I also like these cold, icy, snowy worlds. Well, the, the reason why, um, uh, actually, uh, PJ, uh, here, Click on the link in the private chat, please. Okay, uh, one second. Oh, there you go. That, that'll take you to the, the whole panoramic shot. Oh, okay. That one might uh, be, if you scroll down, it might be actually in that. I don't know. It might oh, be. Yeah, oh, no, it won't be because we're in the yeah, yeah, different, different section, I think. Oh, okay. So, so, yeah, that, that had caught my eye when I saw it in publication. 
And um, one, one of the uh, things that's actually popped into my head while you're, while you're talking about this stuff, a lot, a lot of the stuff is organic. Is this, uh, does this, is this because uh, you'd like to go out into the scenic uh, world and, see, uh, and just explore, you know, nature? In terms of the, um, I traveled to China and uh, India and Nepal in 2004. And I'll, I remember doing, I'll jump back to Farscape. I did one of the map paintings in Farscape, which I think was episode four. And there were these sort of, um, uh, what do you call it? Monument Valley type cliffs and so on. And I did a terrible job of it. Terrible. And I so realized I needed to learn how do you paint? How do you start to see these, these places? How do, you, how do you get it? And when I came back from North India and I was traveling and doing some trekking around the Himalayas, I came back and I worked on a film called um, Seven Swords, of, The Seven Swords of Mount Tian Shan. It was a Chinese film. And I just started painting mountains way better than I'd ever painted before. And I wasn't doing any particular uh, studies of the mountains when I was in the Himalayas, but what I was seeing was burning itself into my brain, like real scale, details at certain distances and so on. You st it just starts to kind of absorb in. So the more you can be outside, the more you can see the real world, the more this will come out. You'll start to remember things as you're painting. You go, okay, I need to be more, there needs to be more of this. The rock has to be coherent. It has to have a certain style to it, a certain character. Um, you know, shapes are going to be a certain direction, certain way. Where is snow going to fall? What is snow likely to do? You know, which is, we don't see much of here in Australia, but it's just things like that. So the more I think you can get out as an artist and see the real world, the, the better it is. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Particularly if you want to do the more realistic type stuff. Real world experience helps. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it does go in. It, it, you know, if you just sit there and look at a sunset, you know, you start to notice all sorts of things. And the more experience you get, the more you'll start to see. That helps too. The panoramic of this one, uh, that George, it's beautiful. Wow. Yeah, uh, because in my imagination, uh, I was more like, holy smokes. Yeah, you know, it's, it's something that just captured my eye the moment I saw it as a cover. And, uh, yeah, you know, like like everything you you have created, it just fought, it just burns in my mind like an imagination of what's going on, you know what, what the possibilities exist. It, it, See that that's yeah. sorry to cut you off, but that's the kind no, of no, thing yeah. I, I've always wanted to do. That's the thing that got me about Star Wars and these matte paintings, and it's that sense of wonder. There's, where's the sense of wonder in Star Trek Discovery? Where is that sense of wonder? Where you yeah. see these images and go, wow, what, uh, what, what if, I, what, oh my god. Yes. I feel you know, like just, a constant sense of uh, dread when I watch Star Trek Discovery, <laughs> especially these mirror universes ones where like, everybody dies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's of dread. Yes, that's, yeah. that's exactly right. Because when I looked at this for the first time, um, you know, this, I got the same sense of wonder when I saw uh, Cloud City for the first time. Exactly. Yeah. You go, what is this place floating in the clouds? What's going on? What about the planet below? And oh, yeah, that's it. That told you, that's it. You nailed it. Cloud City, Dagobah, you know, yeah. Hoth. That's why I like some of the snowy stuff as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's. Makes, yeah. Cloud City, definitely. And, and now, and now also... I w sorry, now I want to get, get into a technical question. Um, I, I've, I've been in a, in, stu in a studio production for film and TV, and I've seen a lot of concept artists, wide ranging, and they're, and they're given certain uh, tasks to do. And a lot of the times the producer or the, the manager, the floor manager would say, yeah, I need this shot, blah, 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 and uh, you got like uh, an hour. And, uh, and all I see is the, the concept painters uh, uh, literally just splash color down, start, uh, and, and then in about an hour, yeah, if, you, if, you, like, if you step away, it looks like a photograph, but if you're, if you're just reasonably close, like uh, two or three feet from the, the screen, you look at it and it's all like just uh, swabs of brush strokes. Yeah, Craig, Craig Mullins is one of those guys that can do that. He was one of the... Um... 
he was a concept artist that I, like I said, I started on the Fifth Island around 96, 1996, but I was doing digital imaging around from 94. Yeah. And I, he was, pro, I think he was working at ILM or doing some stuff at ILM and some of the very early, very, very early uh, digital map paintings or combinations of real and, and digital. He's a master at that stuff. His stuff, if you look at it close, it's just digital, you know, mashed potatoes. But when you step back from that, it just reads. It reads perfectly. Compositionally, the lighting, the, the values of the surfaces and so on, it just, it's perfect. It's, it's absolutely masterful work. Were, um, were you ever put in a, a situation like that uh, from uh, managers who just didn't know any better other than, hey, slave, get this thing done? Uh, within a, Well, we did some stuff with Covenant where they'd send us uh, photographs from the uh, mm -hmm. location um, scouting people in, uh, in New Zealand. And then we would get those and we had to paint stuff into the photo. That's pretty much the closest I've ever had to do, I suppose. I did some stuff for, for Ghostbusters where I just did some sketches on my iPad that were, I think I did like four sketches in a day just to kind of flesh out some ideas. And that was just sort of line, almost like pencil drawings, I suppose. Um, I've, I'm not very good at that sort of fast stuff. I like to think about it. I'm trying to be very pedantic and careful about my camera position and camera placement and composition and where's the lighting. And I need to be able to see it somehow in my head first. And I, that sometimes that just doesn't happen. So I start, <laughs> I have to look, as the clock's ticking, I sweat more and more. And I just go, oh, I can't see it. I can't see it. What is it? Do, do they ever give you a script? So, sorry, so, sorry, sorry, Jack. One, one, one last question. Did they ever give you a script to work off of or was it just a brief? Or sometimes. What, what did it depends you? on the, it depends on a project. Um, say, for instance, on first season of Farscape, uh, Farscape um, Foundation, I think I got two pages of a particular section that described just that scene, and then that's all I was given. Um, I read the entire script for <laughs> Ghostbusters. I think in the last week I was working on it. It might have been the last two days, and I <laughs> managed to finally read the script. So all I was given then was the briefs from the production designer about what, what those scenes were. It depends. It depends. Okay. Sometimes not at all. Sometimes it's just purely brief. I don't think I read the script. Same with Alien. I didn't read the script for Covenant, I think, until I was almost finished, which didn't matter much. So. <laughs> Sorry, Jack, that go ahead. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Ask your question. Sorry. Oh, no, I, I wasn't going to ask a question. I was just going to say that I was very impressed by the work. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. That painting, if you wait, scroll wait. right to the right-hand to the right -hand side, yeah, that one right there, that's a little oil painting There's sketch that I did based on the matte painting from Farscape. Uh, what was that? I can't remember the episode name, but there's oh, a shot wow. where the camera's looking di directly up and then it, it follows um, Crichton's little, his little uh, Earth shuttle and it flies in and the camera tilts down and we go off into that, that distant uh, station. The original design for that was really spindly. And this is this thing stuck by these really thin legs and it was very spindly and I redesigned, did this little sketch and I said, what, what about this? Because, you know, if it's a sort of a desert planet, they're going to use and, and build based on the materials available. Maybe they've found some way to turn the sand into a concrete type mix and they just build these giant blocks and build up this structure. And I liked it, so I turned it into a little oil painting as well. Beautiful. Um, Wayne, is it, do you ever get, have, has it ever happened to you, for example, that you get an author approach you about a cover and you're coming up with something that's high quality, but it's just not what he's looking for or she's looking for? And is it, is it difficult to work in? I did a cover for an author recently or a couple of years ago now that I would have to say was more the other way around. They had visions of uh, a certain thing and I didn't quite pull it off. I think they like it. I think they like the work, but I was trying something that it didn't, not to my eye. And I don't think I particularly accomplished it as best I could. Not that I wasn't trying, it just it didn't work, didn't work out. Um, it, publishing is a different, totally different ball game because they don't have the, the budgets, uh, which is fine. It's okay. I don't mind doing that because, you know, book covers are fun and I like to, if I'm going to do a book cover, I like to do it as an oil painting. And I also like the fact that there's more time 
so I can take my time on it and come up with an idea. And I mean, I did all the Interzone covers, you know, as oil, small oil paintings, because it was fun. But um, yeah, they don't quite have the budgets. Wow, these are, um, yeah, these are Alien Covenant, uh, your Alien Covenant folder here. That's, wow, beautiful stuff. Yeah, that one would have been, oh yeah, that was, quite, yeah, that was some of the first, uh, the pre-production concept artwork, because there's a shot similar to that that was post-production, visual effects concept art. <clears throat> this is, uh, you go on, click, click that one, it's okay. All right, so this, <laughs> this is the, uh, the gratuitous scene that Ridley wanted to put in, there, put in that film for no real reason. So that's the before scene. I see a button. Mm. And then did there's an make, after. Did the scene make it or not? I don't yeah, remember. yeah, yeah. There, there's, it, a, there's a shower scene. Yeah, with these two, is, two making. Is this a combination of a photograph and painting or did you just paint this? Oh. That's well, the figures are 3D. The whole set's 3D. So what I was given that sort of shower cubicle set with these bars and the um, shower outlets, that was a CAD model that the set designers had built. So when they designed that set, the set designer builds, or should I say, designs not just the stuff you'll see in camera, but the um, support structures, the plumbing, and all that sort of thing that will be there because they've got to they've raised it off the ground and they're going to have you know water going all over the place. So there's there's um, a little. I guess, um, closed loop plumbing system going on and where do the cameras set up and all that type of thing. So I just take that, add another wall and then, you know, make it look photographic because at that point no one has seen it in that, in that particular state. So um, what I wanted, what I was hoping for this shot was that the alien, because they're, you know, they're too busy making out and I wanted the alien to use, the, you know, the, the tip of his tail to just go... And scratch, I you know, a little hole, and then go tap. I noticed yeah. a handprint there too, right where the alien's face is. Well, that's yeah, that's them from the from inside the thing. So she's obviously put a hand out, you know, just sort of resting herself against the glass. You know, everything's getting hot and steamy. Like, like but they just, but they don't tap. notice the alien, you know. <laughs> okay, I, I get it now. So you you actually mapped out the different positions. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. That, that's extraordinary that you actually uh, took uh, a CAD uh, file that the the, t the crew had to actually fabricate the the shot. Yep. And now, um, were were you actually actually using the actual model of the CAD, or did you just use it as a, as a reference and you just, and you painted over that? Well, they give me the, they do a export, they'll export the CAD file um, as an OBJ format or an FBX format. And I bring that into Maya and then I set it up so it's all real world. Well, the scale is inherent. It is what it is. And they'll yes. usually include a box, a cube that's one meter by one meter by one meter. And then I just bring that and match that cube to a Maya unit. And then I, once I've got that one meter box, I can add another one and then I can um, fit human figures into that at approximately the right size. So then when I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it in human scale. Uh. So when I set up my camera, I can say, right, well, I've got a wall there. I can't put that camera any further back than that wall. So I have to allow for the physical camera that might be there. But they might say, don't worry about the wall because we're going to remove the wall. So, you know, it's okay. But um, there was a shot I did of inside the shuttle uh, that's landed. And I asked, are you removing the back wall? And they said, no, we're not. That's all part of it. So you have to get your camera in as... Close to the wall as you can, but not too, uh, not too close, and go with the widest lens you can. So it's just knowing those limitations. Yeah, that's the that's the VFX shot. There you go. I did the um, <laughs> the, the the Gandalf and the Lord of the Rings version. Wow. Yeah, that's that's the before. Where, uh, did, you, did you ever produce something where, where they actually would come to you back and say, uh, we have a lot of revisions, a lot of notes? Uh, because... Sometimes that, that can happen, um, particularly if the director is, you know, still exploring ideas or the production designer is still exploring things um, or they're not quite sure or there's a change in location. Uh, this happened a couple of times on uh, the Wolverine where they were going to shoot in Japan and then they were given permission to shoot at one of the capsule hotels in Tokyo, and then that uh, permission was revoked. So they had to then figure out a way to shoot it 
shoot this that scene, the idea of that scene in Sydney. Is that how you got involved in that? I got it. Well, I was involved. I'm not sure what point. I think it had already been going for about a couple of months. Uh, some work had been done, I think, overseas on Wolverine prior in Canada. And then for some reason, the production came to Australia. And the, to be honest, the only reason I got work on that was because they needed Australian workers to get the tax rebate. So ah. they have to hire a certain amount of local talent in order to get the tax rebate to get, you know, to shoot it here cheaply. Right. That, understandable. Okay. Yeah, yeah because I, I, I really, I, you know, uh, that, that, as I said earlier, that Nagasaki scene, I, you know, I wasn't really a fan of that movie, but that Nagasaki scene really, like, captured me. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's kind of like the first part of the movie is really interesting. I really like it. Then it gets into the Silver Samurai thing and it just seems to fall apart. It's just a little bit... Uh, oh, yeah. Any, uh, any comment? Just... I'm sorry. I'll go into PJ. Uh, uh, any comments, Wayne, about how, how like in Mandalorian they're, they're working with these big, huge LED... Uh, um, whatever. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that... that um, screen? What I can call it. Is, is, is that going to be the end of uh, is that going to be the end of concept or not concept art but uh, of the uh, mat art? I'd say so, to some degree. I think. Well, okay. So, matte painting has become one of the reasons I got out of matte painting was because it was becoming very heavy three D. The irony, because now I'm using a lot more three D than I ever did. Um, but it's also a lot of uh, work by committee, and you've got a lot of departments, you know, um, crossing over. Whereas as a concept artist, I'm the one that creates the final painting and I can use whatever tool I like. And as long as I get that image done and it's still, and I don't have to worry about the camera moving, that's visual effects problem, I can just paint the still. And I'm happy to do that. Um, whereas environment art, I'll call it that because it's really no longer matte painting. Okay. It's just heavy. It's a heavy in a lot of people and a lot of, a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. So it was already heavy in the 3D department, I think. This is just an extension of that. And they're using, you know, like Unreal Engine and all that kind of stuff. And they can move things dynamically, you know, on set. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely amazing. I think it's awesome. Obviously, they're going to be limited to, say, someone running from one end of a, say, a football field towards camera. You know, at some, what are they going to do? They can't make one of the, oh, maybe they will one day, who knows, but... You can't build one of those sets the size of a football field. If they do, my God, that'd be awesome because then they'd have the ability to build a lot of set and also have this enormous vista beyond that space and have actors like that shot right there. That's the obviously the live action. You've got a lot of room and a lot of space to move around in the wow. live action setting. But they don't seem to have that with that, that new setup yet. The, the you, stages you'd have are, to build higher walls, wouldn't you? Yeah, and further out, higher, bigger, just, yeah. So I think, you, you know, if you look at the shots, you know, Mando walking to a certain point or characters coming from a certain direction, they're still pretty close to camera. You know, they're not miles and miles away. And if they are miles and miles away, the whole shot might be completely digital. So some some minor limitations but my god it's pretty cool i gotta say it's interactive lighting is just fantastic deep the dps must love it the control they would have is just phenomenal and the fact they can just dynamically move things around and add 3d elements to those backgrounds you know like just like that it's awesome wow um this is a uh, wow. This has uh, been a real treat, Wayne. Um, I I don't um, I I want to uh, thank you for your time. It's been uh, just for me. I, I don't really understand much about this. I, I'm just amazed by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely welcome. Um, it's a good. I'm in a little bit of a lull this week. Um, waiting on some uh, a brief from the next for the next shot for uh, foundation. Um, so I've got, a, I've had a couple of days where like yesterday I did an oil change in my car and, you know, I can sort of just relax. So this has been perfect. It's good, good timing. So it's been, been good. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and, um, there's those damn trees. <laughs> <laughs> there's those damn trees. Uh, Gap Stargate says he's looking forward to seeing the insert of the Stargate in <laughs> that shot. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll have, let's see. 
somehow, somewhere, I'll see if I can insert a Stargate into Foundation. <laughs> it's funny because it almost looks, that shot almost looks like there's a Stargate there. It's got like That's a, the big sort of this stairway with that ramp and this big ball thing. That's a sculpture. Yeah. That, that entrance ball is a, uh, a Soviet era sculpture, I think that was in Czechoslovakia. There's a name for it. And I got some guy contacting me once and saying, you stole this concert, you stole this, you know, uh, sculpture art and you put it in your concept. I said, no, I didn't steal it. Ridley Scott stole it. Because he, <laughs> he had that shot. We knew where it came from. And he oh. has, he steals everything. Absolutely everything. It almost looks right, right here. There's this, like, almost looks like there's a Stargate right there. Yeah, that, I think that was yeah. a sliding door. Like a, it just sort of slid across. But, um, have you guys heard of um, the science fiction book called uh, The Forever War? No. By Joe, no, Joe Halderman. It's, an, yes, awesome, yes, it's yes. an awesome book. It's an awesome story. Well, Ridley Scott had the rights to that. He was going to make that into a movie. Well, there was a graphic novel series that was put out, uh, illustrated by an Italian artist back in the 80s. And it's a small three-volume um, edition that was put out, I think, by Epic Comics at the time. Yes. That's right. And it was in, in it was in English, but they've since republished it as a sort of a compendium um, in one volume in French. And the production designer had that on his desk and it had notes and um, labels sticking out of it. And I said, gee, that looks familiar. And I opened it up and sure enough, it was the Forever War graphic novel. And the production designer said, I don't even know what that is. He said, but Ridley loves it. For some reason, Ridley loves this damn book and I don't know what it is. I said, that's called the Forever War. I said, that's a pretty famous little graphic novel and, and uh, story as well. Um, and I said, but re I really was going to make that once. Well, there's scenes in Covenant where they're all walking through these tall grasses. It's ripped off straight from that graphic novel. There's all these arrows, you know, pointing this frame, this frame, this frame, this frame. This whole sequence is of Covenant. They're just lock, stock and barrel taken from, you know, that, taken from that, steal that so option there. Amazing. <laughs> And this is from The Greatest Showman? Yes, these, these were the last matte paintings I did. I actually came out of matte painting retirement to do these for an old friend of mine, uh, the director, Peter, uh, Michael Gracie. And he said, um, I said, look, I'm, I'll do them, but I said, I, you know, if you've got moving cameras and all that kind of stuff, I'm not interested. I don't want to be tracking 3D or any sort of stuff. He said, no, 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 no. He says, I want the old school, you know, hog style, flat, non-moving, just, you know. I was like, oh, okay, all right. So I did those. Wow. Yeah, Very so nice. you can you can see the the lighting rigs and stuff on on top of those curtains there and all that stuff. And then there's the yeah the paint. Right I think it's the painting below. Oh, the painting below. There you go. And obviously, I've chopped all the people off because I don't need that. So I just he'll take that element and then throw that into the uh, composite that into the live action. And then same with that one. So that's the matte painting component. That was another thing I was always sort of fascinating about it, as matte painting is just this this portion of the frame. It's the painting, and everything else is the is the shot. You know. Wow. Wow. Um, well, uh, I I would um, um, Wayne. Anytime you're you're always welcome back um, because uh, it's it's been such a treat and um, oh yeah cool. thank you it, it, is there anything you want to talk uh, is there anything you want to um, promote or or, or, or plug um, not really just like I said my YouTube channel is you know probably going to stay dormant for a while until I finish up you know getting some work done and put something else up there eventually. Um, yeah, nothing really. I mean, if you're interested in concept art and learning some of those uh, procedures and techniques that I've got, like the Rover Scout concept art tutorial right there for 35 bucks, rush off and, you know, have a go at that. And where is that? But, we're, we're... Well, I, I've, that I can sell, I'm selling that on the ArtStation page because they've got a bit okay. of a marketplace thing going as well, but uh, also my Gumroad page, which if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see I've got links to my Gumroad page. Okay. I also sell well, photo please. packs of like, Photographs of skies and uh, in uh, high res raw formats and just reference for other concept artists, map painters who might want to use it. 
what I'll do is I'm going to put uh, all those links below the video um, for anybody who's listening, watching now, or, or watching the replay. Um, those links will be below the video you're watching. Um, um, awesome. Any final uh, any final questions, gentlemen, for for Wayne? Before we uh, we he's been so generous with us. Um, I, I want to. I'm I'm fr I got plenty of time today, so like I said, your timing's perfect. You just kick back and. So oh, okay. Well, uh, my my next question, if you don't mind, is um, have you ever been uh, because you're you're in the the creative process of of everything that you're producing for TV and film. Have you ever come across uh, Joe Jarsky's uh, Dune, uh, what called Bible that he gave to the studios in the seventies? I, I think I've seen some of the images here and there because Chris Foss was one of the original artists in that, but I I haven't seen all of it. Oh, it, it that that um, is that is such a, um, a holy grail. Because I think Mobius also did some of the costume designs for that too. So. Oh yes, his his yeah. work was uh, all over the place in that yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, that would have been trippy. <laughs> that would have been very trippy. That <laughs> that version. It, Interesting it, to see how the new one is going to turn out. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, another question is: Is there any project, any property that uh, you would hope? that would be like awesome to work at and, and not in terms of work and because because i understand uh, uh, i'm assuming uh, since you love doing the work that you're doing it's not really work because it's just your love of the of the of the art oh it has its days don't you worry <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it, 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 have it, days. yes it's true is there a project or 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 a, a property that you just would, would jump at the chance? If there was a really good Star Trek film or something like that, I'd love to do a, you know, just one of those, you know, like the classic Star Trek paintings of um, the steps to Mount Soleil in that that structure. Those, wow. Oh, yeah. Some of those are just beautiful and classic. You know, I'd love to be able to do one of those. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of hint, hint, I'm doing something for Mr. Doomcock. Uh, along those lines, actually. Oh, yeah. awesome. um, so Congratulations, Mr. Doomcock. Uh, did David um, asks, Wayne, David asks, um, uh, now yeah, I know you uh, haven't worked for Star Trek, but have you done any Star Trek art? No, no, none, never, never. Even for yourself? No, there's no. too many people doing, doing all that stuff. I. If you're good at what, what you're doing, don't do it for free. Well, I do. I do all these, you know, oil paintings for free. So, and I oh, do yeah, those sketches enough. and so on. <laughs> yeah, it's that thing you've got to do. You just as an artist, you want to do something. You want to express something. You want to see something that's not out there. Something you'd like to see in Star Trek, or something you'd like to see in Star Wars, or an equivalent type thing. So you just have to do it yourself. You know. That makes sense. Oh, oh, I have one. Okay, I got another question. It did. It, um, in an artist and a writer's um, a pro a professional um, life, there comes a moment when uh, a, a, you would come across someone that you revered for such a long time because uh, as a novice, as you're growing in skill and experience, did that, uh, did, that uh, did you have that ex uh, meeting experience with any of the people that you revered when you were such a young child uh, gr growing into this field? Yes, I did actually. Um, I've met a couple of them. When I did the Eluxcon uh, exhibition in um, Allentown a few years back, one of the, as I said in the early part of the conversation, one of the artists I like was a, a guy named Jim Burns. Um, Jim Burns, John Harris, Chris Moore, these guys have all done paintings on some of the most iconic science fiction properties, you know, ever. And they've been around for, you know, since the 70s and 80s. And I just, so interesting and f full of awe and wonder. And I was, I've been very fortunate to actually exhibit alongside Jim Burns and Chris Moore and John Harris um, in those last couple of Aluxcon uh, wow. exhibitions. And, they, you know, they say you should never meet your heroes, but... I'm 
so blessed and fortunate that these guys were also the best people I've ever met as well. They're just awesome people. They're just great to hang out with. We had a lot of laughs. They drink like fish, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, it was just I, one, one of the best things I've, you know, experienced as an artist. But certainly that seeing these their art for many, many years as a, as a young artist and as a, as a young person and then getting to exhibit alongside them was just uh, absolute privilege they, and amazing. Oh, that's fantastic. Did they, did they say anything like, uh, hey, uh, you're a good kid. Uh, you're going places. You got, you got style. You got potential. Keep it up. Yeah, keep working at it. Another 20 years and you might be all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, they were actually, they, they were very, very, uh, very amazing with their praise of my work. So I was like blown away. So I didn't expect that. Didn't expect that at all. But I've been, you know, <clears throat> ah, super lucky. Super lucky. I got to interview Anthony Daniels when I was in secondary school. My media studies teacher really knew that I oh, like I hate school. Deal? Yeah, yeah. Though he, he was doing a bit of a tour, a pro publicity tour for Return of the Jedi. I think it was just before it came out. And my media studies teacher knew that I was a you know a real Star Wars fan and in science fiction and you know interest in film and combining images together and so on and. He came into my class one day and he said, uh, I, I need to speak to Wayne for a minute to the teacher. I can't remember what the class was. And I said, oh, oh here we go. What have I done now? You know, and he says, you'll never guess who I'm going to meet today. And I said, who's that? And he says, Anthony Daniels. The rest of my class had no clue who that was because he said Anthony <laughs> Daniels. They had no clue, no idea. Zero. And I went, are you kidding me? I said, you lucky bastard. <laughs> I said, get me an autograph. And he says, well, you're going to, we'll do better than that. He says, I want you to write 20 questions in the next half an hour. And then we're going to go and do the interview. And I'm like, far out. <laughs> so uh, I got to meet C3PO. But I wow. said to the teacher, I said to the teacher, we have to go home. I've got to go home and get my camera first. We can't go just yet. And he says, all right, then we better leave soon. We better leave early. So we rush all the way out to the suburbs to my house. I get my camera and a roll of film load up the camera, we do the interview, I take some pictures afterwards. Then I go to wind the film back into the canister and it's not winding back in. Oh, oh no. It, it never caught on the spool. I never got the pictures. Oh, oh God. I was like, oh no. But I still have that the interview. Tragic. It was, yeah, for a 16 year old. I was like, <laughs> God. But that was cool. So I got to meet C3P. I was you know, one of my heroes as well. Yeah, at least that. Yeah. Uh, Gap Stargate says that he would love to see your take on Disney's Black Hole if they ever remake it. <laughs> well, that all comes down to, as a concept artist, that all comes down to the, obviously, the director, uh, what's in the script, and the production designer. So it's usually third hand by the time I get it. And then whatever <laughs> I've been given is some take on an existing idea, I suppose you could say. Now, in that painting... While we're here, I mentioned some of this on the Doomcock's, Doomcock's channel, but there's a, on the runway of that spaceport is a Qantas jet. It's got the red tail with a kangaroo. Really? Can't really see it. Yeah. On the runway. On the sort of the left runway, not the main runway, but that left runway, the secondary minor one on the left. Sort of below the. Oh, that's over here. Like where, the, where the cursor is? Yep. That's the one. Now this is how badly this is painted. The scale of that jet and that tail would be enormous. It's just wrong. The scale is completely wrong. That whole painting. <laughs> it kind of works because it's on screen for just a few seconds, but it's, uh, I've got the Sydney Opera House in there somewhere. There's a hamburger. Wow. There's, a, <laughs> there's a bunch of silly stuff. The Statue of Liberty. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. in the last... In the last frame of this shot, I don't know whether it'd be in the Blu-ray. I'm not sure, but there's that ticker tape that runs around that pr the top of that d that um, dome, and it says "Welcome to New York, Welcome to New York, Welcome to New York," and then at the very last frame, it says "Now fuck off." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's just, it's just that, it's it's establishing shots like this that's um, made uh, Fifth Elements uh, other than the acting. Uh, is, is such a spectacular thing to see. Uh, it, it, there's a, because what you're uh, w when I saw this, um, 
it, it was it was like the experience of watching a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger Total Recall. All mm -hmm. all all the shots in that movie, they were all close. Uh, there uh, there wasn't any real establishing shot of the environment un, until right. uh, you saw the shuttle making a slow landing on Mars. That was the only establishing shot that you ever got of what the world of sci-fi it, it, it actually looked like. But after that, it, it, everything, every, all the other shots were close. They were close and personal. Well, you know, let me and just I say, just, uh, let me just say bye to Bird because he's gonna he's gonna leave. Uh, thanks, thanks, Bird of Prey, for joining us. Thank you guys for having me, Wayne. Great to meet you. Yeah, you too, Bird of Prey. Uh, everyone Kapla. else. Kapla, have a great night or day great or whatever. Might be Kapla, for you. Bird. Take care, guys. Take care. See you later. Uh, yeah, yeah so I think a, back in the day, I mean, they didn't quite have that flexibility and freedom to have digital shots. I mean, again, this was early days. This was early digital, so there was still some limitation to the types of shots they could do. But being digital, it's a lot faster and it's a lot easier to, to create these scenes and you can do whatever you like. So back, that's sort of, you know, the that era, the, those, those 80s films, they're still dependent on physical map paintings and they just can't do a lot with that. And that was the thing as an artist, as a young artist wanting to see more of those scenes. I want to see more, I want to see more of that world. It was always the, the one map painting you go, oh my God, that's mind blowing. And then the rest of the film was just these, you know, mid and close up shots of Yeah, exactly, kind of stuff. exactly. Right. It was always frustrating, but now they've got the so, technology. Now we can see whatever we want. So have you, uh, have you always done it on just a Mac? Um, have you have you transitioned to anything like a tablet when you do these drawings? <laughs> when I first did my when I did my portfolio, uh, my photography portfolio, and I took that to the US, and I as I said earlier, I did all of that with a mouse, just a, a early Mac, um, the eighty was it the eighty eight ten eighty AV or whatever it was. So when I first started working on the Fifth Element, this guy comes in with a little four by five inch. Wacom tablet. He says, here you go, you're going to need one of these. And I said, no, oh, that's okay. I just use a mouse. <laughs> and they looked at me stupid like, what? Are you talking? What? what are you, you idiot? And they plugged it in and I used it within about 10 seconds. I was like, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. This is much, incredible. much better, right? <laughs> yeah, I was like, God, oh, what was I thinking? Jesus. So, um, yeah, I, was, I did all that stuff on the fifth element on SGI because they had a box under that everyone had an SGI and I was using Photoshop version 3, well, no, sorry, version 4 for SGI. But everything since, every, everything since then has been uh, on the Mac. So. Loving the details you've been bringing out today. It's wonderful. Yeah, no problem. It's um, a lot of fun. I want to thank um, I want to thank Wayne for for just have giving us some amazing amazing uh, what a treat really thank you so much Wayne um, and I want to have I want to you're always welcome back and if you want to like join us on the panel anytime you're always welcome to just uh, DM me and just jump in if you want cool thanks very much I'll probably take you up on that a lot of fun. And actually, I'd like to invite you. I did, I, I, you know, not not. There's a lot of people who have not gotten into dark matter, and the fact that you have gotten into it, I I definitely like to invite you. Uh, um, we usually pick an episode on a Monday, and we all watch it together, and then we talk about it. If you'd like to join us on a Monday, I, what I'll what I'll do then is I'll probably catch up and go back through the series, the seasons again, and rewatch and from there because i always remember thinking man I just if this had more budget if this had a bigger budget he did a I'm lot sure there's just so much that could be seen and explored in that world yeah. it was really just they getting did interesting. so much with, with great, great premise it was really good yeah same with fastgate i mean you know can you imagine what they do with fastgate today oh good gosh what about babylon 5. or babylon 5 exactly that was another one yep yep Absolutely. Yeah. Big. Yeah. Very cool. Um, thank you to everybody. Uh, thank you, George, uh, Bird of Prey, Jack. Um, I want to thank uh, Gap Stargate, Dave Chilson, Random Brad, um, everybody who's been in here because um, we've had so many people in here. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's watching us on the replay. Um, Wayne, I want to just give you the last word. 
Live long and prosper. <laughs> hey, old chat. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Nice, nice to meet you guys. Been been uh, fun chatting. Thanks, PJ. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you.